They don't care about AI safety. What they care about is AI control. Do I think we eventually get to a configuration like that? Maybe. Where you have an AI brain is at the center of civilization and it's coordinating all the people around it. And every civilization that makes it is capable of crowdfunding and operating its own AI. You know, our background culture influences things in ways we don't even think about. So much of the paperclip thinking is like a vengeful God will turn you into pillars of salt. The polytheistic model of many gods as opposed to one God is we're all going to have our own AI gods and there'll be war of the gods. Man-machine symbiosis is not some new thing. It's actually the old thing that broke us away from other primate lineages that weren't using tools. Then the question is, what's the next step? Which is AI is amplified intelligence. It is that the AI human fusion means there's another 20 Elon Musks or whatever the number is. That's good. Hello, and welcome to The Cognitive Revolution, where we interview visionary researchers, entrepreneurs, and builders working on the frontier of artificial intelligence. Each week, we'll explore their revolutionary ideas, and together, we'll build a picture of how AI technology will transform work, life, and society in the coming years. I'm Nathan LeBenz, joined by my co-host, Eric Torenberg. Hello, and welcome back to The Cognitive Revolution. Today, my guest is Balaji Srinivasan. In tech circles, Balaji needs no introduction. But for folks from other backgrounds, Balaji is a serial startup entrepreneur who's founded and ultimately sold highly dissimilar technology companies, including Teleport, which helped people move around the world to realize opportunities, Council, which provided genetic testing for couples planning to have children, and Earn.com, a paid email on the blockchain startup, which ultimately sold to Coinbase, where Balaji became CTO. Along the way, he's also taught statistics at Stanford and been a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz as well. Today, as an independent thinker, investor, and author of The Network State, Balaji is extremely prolific in both text and audio formats. And as you'll hear, whether for the first time or the 50th, he is an incredibly creative thinker who relentlessly develops and iterates on new paradigms for understanding a fast-changing, often chaotic world. He's also a very associative and interdisciplinary thinker who constantly adds dimensions to any analysis. Such horsepower can be hard for a podcast host to rein in, but I personally find it extremely stimulating. So in this conversation, I tried to strike a balance between letting Balaji go off as only he can do, contributing what I hope are worthy versions of core AI safety arguments, and supporting results from recent research, and occasionally steering us back toward what I see as the most critical questions for the AI big picture. If there's one area where Balaji and I disagree most consequentially, it's on the question of how independent AI systems are likely to become over the next five to 10 years. Balaji thinks that AI systems need to be at least symbiotic with humans because physical computers can't replicate themselves without human support. Well, I think there's at least a significant chance that we get AIs that are so independent of humans that their behaviors and interactions become the primary drivers of world history. In Balaji's own words, he does expect massive economic and social disruption from AI, but doesn't think that quote unquote, can't turn the killer AI off scenarios are likely, at least for a long while, due to factors like the existence of adversarial inputs that can paralyze AIs, particularly those with open model weights, the observation that even decentralized programs like the Bitcoin network can't run independently without continuous human support, and the premise that to control the physical world, AIs will need to direct either large numbers of humans who are notoriously difficult to control or highly agile robots, which don't yet exist. With all that in mind, in the first half of this conversation, you'll hear Balaji's analysis of the likely impact of AI in a world where powerful AI systems do come to exist, but humans retain control, resulting in a human AI symbiosis similar to how believers relate to their gods or citizens relate to their governments. Then in the second half, we really dig into the question of just how confident we should be that AI won't prove to be even more revolutionary than that. After more than two hours of recording, I was the one who ran out of time today, but I really enjoyed this conversation with Balaji. He is as good-natured and curious as he is opinionated, and we have continued to exchange links and arguments offline, such that I hope we'll have another episode to share with you in the future as well. 
As always, if you're enjoying the show, we'd ask that you'd take a moment to share it with a friend. And with that, here's part one of an all angles look at how AI will shape the future with Balaji Srinivasan. Balaji Srinivasan, welcome to the Cognitive Revolution. All right. I, I feel welcome. Well, we've got a ton to talk about. You know, obviously, you bring a lot of uh, different perspectives to everything that you think about and uh, work on. And today, I want to just try to muster all those different perspectives onto this, you know, what I see as really the defining question of our time, which is like, what's up with AI? And, you know, how's it going to turn out? I thought maybe for starters, I would love to just get your baseline kind of table setting on how much more AI progress do you expect us to see over the next few years? Like how powerful are AI systems going to become in, again, kind of a relatively short timeline? And then maybe if you want to take a you know bigger stab at it, you could answer that same question for a longer timeline, like the rest of our lives or whatever. Sure. Let me give an abstract answer, then let me give a technical answer. You know, if you look at evolution, uh, we've seen something as complex as flight, evolve independently in birds, bats, and bees. And uh, even intelligence, we've seen fairly high intelligence in dolphins, in whales, in octopuses. Uh, you know, octopus in particular can do like tool manipulation. They've got things that are a lot like hands, you know, with tentacles. And so that indicates that it is plausible that you could have multiple pathways to intelligence uh, whether you know we have carbon-based intelligence, so we could have silicon-based intelligence that just has a totally different form, where the fundamental thing is an electromagnetic wave and data storage, as opposed to you know DNA and, and so on, right? So that's like a plausibility argument in terms of evolution as being so resourceful that it's in, invented really complicated things in different ways. Okay. Then in terms of the technical point, I think as of like right now, I should probably date it as like December 11, 2023, because this field moves so fast, right? My view is, and maybe you'll have a different view, is that the breakthroughs that are really needed for something that's like true artificial intelligence that is um, is human independent, right? Maybe the next step after the Turing test, I've got an article that you know we're writing called the Turing thresholds, which tries to generalize the Turing test to like the Kardashev scale. You know, have you got energy thresholds? Like, what are useful scales beyond that? And right now, I think that what we call AI is absolutely amazing for environments that are not time varying or rule varying. And what I mean by that is, uh, so you kind of have, let's say two large schools of AI, and obviously there's overlap in terms of the personnel and so on, but there's like the DeepMind school, which has gotten less press recently, but got more press you know, a few years ago. And that is uh, game playing, right? It is uh, you know, superhuman playing of, Al of, of Go with AlphaGo. It is, um, you know, all the video game stuff they've done where they learn at the pixel level and they don't, they just teach the very basic rules and it figures it out from there. And it's also, you know, the, the protein folding stuff and what have you, right? But in general, I think they're known for reinforcement learning and, and those kinds of approaches. I mean, they're good at a lot of things, but that's what I think DeepMind is known for. Of course, they put out this new model recently, the, the Gemini model. So I'm not saying that they're not good at everything, but that's just kind of what they're maybe most known for. And then you have the OpenAI ChatGPT school of generative AI, and it include stable diffusion, and um, just as a pioneer, even if, you know, they're not, I don't know how much they're used right now, but basically, you know, you have the diffusion models for images and you have uh, large language models and now you have the multimodals that integrate them. And so the difference I think with these is the, uh, the reinforcement learning approaches are based on an assumption of static rules, like the rules of chess, the rules of Go, the rules of a video game are not changing with time. They are discoverable. They're like the laws of physics. And Similarly, like the body of language where you're learning it, English is not rapidly time varying. Uh, that is to say the, the rules of grammar that are implicit aren't changing. The meanings of words aren't changing very rapidly. You can argue they're changing over the span of decades or centuries, but not extremely rapidly, right? So therefore, when you generate a new result, training data from five years ago for English is actually still fairly valuable. And the same input roughly gives the same output. Now, of course, there are facts that change with time, um, like who is the, the ruler of England, right? The queen of England has passed away. Now it's the king of England, right? It's just facts that change with time. But I think more fundamentally is when there's rules that change with time. You know, you have, uh, uh, for example, changes in law in countries, right? But most interestingly, perhaps changes in markets. 
because the same input does not give the same output in a market. If you try that, then what will happen is there's adversarial behavior on the other side. And once people see it enough times, they'll see your strategy and they're going to trade against you on that, right? And I can get to other technical examples on that, but I think, and probably people in the space are aware of this, but I think that is the true frontier, is dealing with time-varying, rule-varying systems, as opposed to systems where the implicit rules are static. Let me pause there. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think the, you know, in the very practical you know, just trying to get, as Zvi calls it, mundane utility from AI that is often kind of cashed out to AI is good at tasks, but it's not good at whole jobs. You know, it can handle these kind of small things where you can define, you know, what good looks like and, and tell it exactly what to do. But in the sort of broader context of, you know, handling things that come up as they come up, it's definitely not there yet. And I agree that there's likely to be some synthesis, you know, which is a kind of the the subject of all the Q star rumors recently, I would say, is kind of the the prospect that there could be already, you know, within the the labs, a beginning of a synthesis between the, I kind of think of it as like harder edged reinforcement learning systems, you know, that are like small, efficient and deadly versus the like language model systems that are like, kind of slow and soft and, you know, but have a sense of our values, which is really a remarkable accomplishment that, um, that they're able to have even, you know, an approximation of our values that seems like reasonably good. So yeah, I think I agree with that framing, but I, I guess I would, you know, still wonder like, how far do you think this goes in the near term because I have a lot of uncertainty about that. And I think the field has a lot of uncertainty. You'll hear people say, well, you know, it's never going to get smarter than its training data. You know, it'll kind of level out where humans are, but we certainly don't see that in the reinforcement learning side, right? Like once it, it usually don't take too long at human level of these games. And then it like blows past human level. Interestingly, you do still see some adversarial vulnerability. Like there's a great paper from uh, the team at far AI. And I'm, I'm planning to have Adam Gleave, the head of that organization on soon to talk about that and other things where they found like a, basically a hack where a really simple, but unexpected attack on the superhuman go player can defeat it. So you do have these like very interesting vulnerabilities or kind of lack of adversarial robustness. Still, I kind of wondering like, where do you think that leaves us in say a three to five years time? Obviously huge uncertainty on that. It's really hard to predict something like this. Just to your point, Generative AI is generic AI, right? It's like generically smart, but doesn't have specific intelligence or creativity or facts. And as you're saying, just like we have, you know, adversarial images that can fool programs that are trained on a certain set of data and they just give some weird, you know, pattern that looks like a giraffe, but the algorithm thinks it's a dog. Uh, you can do the same thing for game playing and you can have out of sample input that can beat, um, you know, these, these very sophisticated uh, reinforcement learners. And an interesting question is whether that is a fundamental thing or whether it is a workaroundable thing. And you'd think it was workaroundable, you know, uh, because there's probably some robustification because the, these pictures look like giraffes, you know, and yet they're being recognized as dogs. So there, there's, you would think that uh, the right proximity metric would group it with giraffes, you know, but maybe there's some, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's some result there. My, my intuition would be we can probably robustify these systems so that they are less vulnerable to adversarial input. But if we can't, then that leads us in a totally different direction where these systems are fragile in a fundamental way. So that's one big branch point is how fragile these systems are. Because if they're fragile in a certain way, then it's almost like you can always kill them which is kind of good, right, in a sense, that there's that, you know, almost like the, you know, the 50 IQ, 100 IQ, 150 IQ thing. Like the the meme? Yeah, the meme, right? So the 50 IQ guy's like, these machines will never be as creative as, as humans or whatever. 100 IQ is look at all the things they can do. The 150 IQ is like, well, there's some like equivalent, equivalent result, you know, that's like some impossibility proof that shows that we, the dimensional space of a giraffe is too high and we can't actually learn what a true giraffe. I don't think that's true, but maybe it's true from the perspective of how these learners are working. 
Because my understanding is people have been trying, and I mean, I'm, I'm not on the cutting edge of this, so you know, maybe someone, but my understanding is we haven't yet been able to robustify these uh, models against adversarial input. Am I wrong about that? Yeah, that's definitely right. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Real quick, what's the easiest choice you can make? Taking the window instead of the middle seat, outsourcing business tasks that you absolutely hate. What about selling with Shopify? Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Whether you're selling security systems or marketing memory modules, Shopify helps you sell everywhere, from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. I've used it in the past at the companies I've founded, and when we launch merch here at Turpentine, Shopify will be our go-to. Shopify helps turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And Shopify helps you sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. With Shopify Magic, whip up captivating content that converts from blog posts to product descriptions. Generate instant FAQ answers. Pick the perfect email send time, Plus, Shopify magic is free for every Shopify seller. Businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash cognitive. Go to shopify.com slash cognitive now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash cognitive. Omniki uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in OmniKey so much that I invested in it, and I recommend you use it too. Use CogRev to get a 10% discount. There's no single architecture, as far as I know, that is demonstrably robust. And on the contrary, you know, even with language models, there's a, we did a whole episode on the universal jailbreak, where especially if you have access to the weights, not to change the weights, but just to kind of probe around in the weights, then you have a really hard time, you know, guaranteeing any sort of robustness. The conjecture is, see, for humans, you can't like mirror their brain and analyze it. Okay. But we have enough humans that we've got things like optical illusions, stuff like that, that works on enough humans. Um, and our brains aren't changing enough, right? A conjecture is if you had, as you said, open weights, open weights mean safety because if you have open weights, you can always reverse engineer adversarial input, and then you can always break the system. Conjecture. Yeah, there's I. That's again with uh, Adam from Far AI. I'm I'm really interested to get, get into that because they are starting to study, as I understand it, kind of proto scaling laws for adversarial robustness. And I think a huge question there is, what are the kind of frontiers of possibility there? Like, do you need you know, how do the orders of magnitude work, right? Do you need another 10x as much adversarial training to half the rate of your adversarial failures? And if so, you know, can we generate that many? It, it may always sort of be fleeting. So far AI, and they are, uh, uh, so they're working on cutting edge of adversarial input. Yeah, they're the group that did the attack on the alpha go model, and found that like, you know, and what was really interesting about that, I mean, multiple things, right? First, that they could beat a superhuman Go player at all. But second, that the technique that they used would not work at all if playing a quality human. Or is, you know, it's a strategy that is trivial to beat if you're a quality human Go player, but the alpha Go is just totally blind to it. You know, that's why I say the conjecture is if you have the model, then you can generate the adversarial input. And then, so if that is true, and that itself is an important conjecture about AI safety, right? Because if open weights are inherently something where you can generate adversarial input from that and break or crash or defeat the AI, then that AI is not omnipotent, right? You have some power words you can speak to it, almost like magical words that'll just make it power down, so to speak, right? It's like those movies where the monsters can't see you if you stand really still or if you you don't make a noise or something like that, right? They're very powerful on dimension X, but they're very weak on dimension Y. 
a kind of an obvious point, but you know, I'm not sure how important it's going to be in the future. Your next question was on like, you know, humanoid robots and so on. And before we get to that, maybe obviously, but all of these models are trained on things that we can easily record, which are sights and sounds, right? But touch and taste and smell, we don't have amazing data sets on those. Well, I mean, there's some haptic stuff, right? Uh, there's there's probably some, you know, some work on taste and smell and so on, but there's, there's five senses, right? I wonder if there's something like that where uh, you might be like, okay, how are you going to outsmell a, you know, a robot or something like that? Well, dogs actually have a very powerful sense of smell. And that's being very important for them, you know? And it may turn out that there's, maybe it's just that we just haven't collected the data and it could become a much better smeller or whatever, or, you know, taster than anything else. I wouldn't be surprised. It could be a much better wine taster uh, because you can do molecular diagnostics. But it's just kind of, I just use that as an analogy to say there's areas of the human experience that we haven't yet quantified. And maybe it's just the, the operative term is yet, okay? But there's areas of the human experience we haven't yet quantified, which are also an area that AIs at least are not yet capable of. Yeah, I guess it, maybe my expectation boils down to, I think the really powerful systems are probably likely to mix architectures in some sort of ensemble. You know, when you think about just the structure of the brain, it's not, I mean, there certainly are aspects of it that are repeated, right? You look at the, the frontal cortex and it's like there is kind of this you know unit that gets repeated over and over again in a sense that's kind of analogous to say the transformer block that just gets you know stacked layer on layer but it is striking in a transformer that it's basically the same exact mechanism at every layer that's doing kind of all the different kinds of processing and so whatever weaknesses that structure has and you know with the transformer and the attention mechanism there's like some pretty profound ones like finite context window you know, you kind of need, I would think, a different sort of architecture with a little bit of a different strength and weakness profile to complement that in such a way that, you know, kind of more similar to like a biological system where you kind of have this like dynamic feedback where, you know, if, if we have obviously, you know, thinking fast and slow and all sorts of different modules in the brain and they kind of cross regulate each other and don't let any one system, you know, go totally you know, down the wrong path on its own, right? Without something kind of coming back and, and trying to override that. It seems to me like that's a big part of what is missing from the current crop of AIs in terms of their robustness. And I don't know how long that takes to show up, but we are starting to see some, you know, possible, you know, I think people are maybe thinking about this a little bit the wrong way. They're just in the last couple of weeks, there's been a number of papers that are really looking at the state space model Kind of alternative it's being framed as an alternative to the transformer but when i see that i'm much more like it's probably a complement to the transformer or you know it, it, these two things probably get integrated in some form because to the degree that they do have very different strengths and weaknesses ultimately you're going to want the best of both in a in a robust system certainly if you're trying to make an agent certainly if you're trying to make you know a humanoid robot that can go around your house and like do useful work but also be robust enough that it doesn't uh, you get tricked into attacking your kid or your dog or you know whatever you're going to want to have more checks and, and balances than just kind of a single stack of you know the same block over and over again. Well, so I know Boston Dynamics with their legged robots is all control theory and it's not classical ML. They've, it's really interesting to see how they've accomplished it, and they do have essentially a state space model where they have a big position vector that's got all the coordinates of all the joints and then a bunch of matrix algebra to figure out how this thing is moving and all the feedback control and so on there. And it's more complicated than that, but that's, you know, I think the V1 of it. So uh, it was there, I wasn't following this though. Are you saying that there's papers that are integrating that with the kind of generative AI transformer model? Um, you know, what, what, like what's a good citation for me to look at? Yeah, starting to, um, we did an episode, for example, with one of the technology leads at Skydio, the you know the U.S.'s champion drone maker, and they have kind of a similar thing where they have built over you know a decade, right, a fully explicit multiple orders of you know spanning multiple orders of magnitude control stack, and now over the top of that, they're starting to layer this kind of you know it's not exactly generative AI in their case because they're not like generating content, but 
it's kind of the high level, you know, can I give the thing verbal instructions, have it go out and kind of understand, okay, like this is a bridge. I'm supposed to kind of, you know, survey the bridge and translate those high level instructions to a plan and then use the the lower level explicit code that is is fully deterministic and you know runs on control theory and all that kind of stuff to actually execute the plan at a low level but also you know at times like surface errors up to the top and say like hey we've got a problem you know whatever i'm not able to do it you know can you now at the higher level the semantic layer adjust the plan that stuff is starting to happen in in multiple domains i would say yeah and so i, I think that makes sense is basically it's like generative ai is almost the front end and then you have almost like an assembly like you give instructions to Figma and the objects there are their shapes and their images and so on. There's not, it's not text. You give instructions to a drone and the objects are like GPS coordinates and paths and so on. And so you are generating structures that are in a different domain or it's like in VR, you're generating 3D structures again, as opposed to text. And then that compute engine takes those three structures and does something with them in a much more rules-based way. So you have like a statistical user-friendly front end with a generative AI, and then you have a more deterministic or usually totally deterministic, almost like assembly language backend that actually takes that and does something. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah, pretty much. And I would say there's another analogy to just, again, our biological experience where it's like, I'm, you know, sort of in a semi-conscious level, right? I kind of think about what I want to do. But the low level movements of the hand, you know, are, are both like not conscious. And also, you know, if I do encounter some pain or, you know, hit, hit some, you know, hot item or whatever, like there's a quick reaction that's sort of mediated by a lower level control system. And then that fires back up to the brain and is like, hey, you know, we need a new plan here. So that is only starting to come into focus, I think, with, you know, because obviously, these, I mean, it's amazing, as you said, it's all moving so fast. What is always striking to me, I just and I, I kind of like re recite timelines to myself almost as like a mantra, right? Like the first instruction following AI that hit the public was just January 2022. That was OpenAI's Text DaVinci 002 was the first one where you could say like do X and it would do X as opposed to having, you know, an elaborate prompt engineering type of setup. GPT-4, you know, just a little over a year ago, finished training, not even a year that it's been in the public. And you know, it's, it, it has been amazing to see how quickly this kind of technology is being integrated into those systems, but it's definitely still very much a work in progress. Yeah. I mean, the tricky part is um, like the training data and so on with like a large existing scale company like a Figma or DJI that has millions or billions of user sessions will have a much easier time training and, and they have a unique data set. And then everybody else will not be able to do that. So there is actually almost like, I mean, a return on scale where the massive data set, if you've got a massive clean data set in a unique domain that lots of people are using, then you can you can crush it. Um, and if you don't, I suppose, there, I mean, there's lots of people who work on zero shot stuff and, and so on and so forth, but it still strikes me that there'll probably be an advantage to see those sessions. You know, I, I, I find it hard to believe that you could, you know, generate a really good uh, like drone, command language without lots of drone flight pads, but you know, you could see. And where it doesn't exist, people are, you know, obviously you need deep pockets for this, but the likes of Google are starting to just grind out the generation of that, right? They've got their kind of test kitchen, which is a literal, you know, physical kitchen at Google where the robots go around and do tasks. And when they get stuck, my understanding of their kind of critical path as, as I understand they understand it is robots going to get stuck will have a human operator remotely operate the robot to show what to do. And then that data becomes the bridge from what the robot can't do to what it's supposed to learn to do next time. And they're going to need a lot of that, you know, for sure. But they increasingly have, you know, I don't know exactly how many robots they have now, but last I talked to someone there, it was like into the dozens. And, you know, presumably they're continuing to scale that. I, I think they just view that they can probably brute force it to the point where it's like good enough to put out into the world. And then very much like a Waymo or a cruise or whatever, they probably still have kind of remote operators, even when the robot is like in your home, you know, when it encounters something that it doesn't know what to do about, 
raise that alarm, get the human supervision to help it over the hump. And then, you know, obviously that's where you really get the scale that you're talking about. And this raises a couple of questions I wanted to, to ask that are conceptual. So, you know, obviously there's huge questions around like, again, highest level, how is all this going to play out? One big debate is to what degree does AI favor the incumbents? To what degree, you know, does it enable startups? Obviously, it's both, but, you know, I'd be interested in your perspective on that. Also really interested in your perspective on, like, offense versus defense. That's something that a lot of people now and in the future, right, it, that seems like it probably really matters a lot, whether it's a, a more offense-enabling or defense-enabling technology. So love your take on, on those two dimensions. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Omniki uses generative AI enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in OmniKey so much that I invested in it, and I recommend you use it too. Use CogRev to get a 10% discount. If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000. That's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamline accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist, designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash cognitive. That's netsuite.com slash cognitive to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash cognitive. So like offense or defense in the sense of disenabled disruptors or incumbents? Both in business and in like, you know, potentially outright conflict. I'd be uh, interested to hear your analysis on both. All right. A lot of views on this. So obviously, if you've got a competent existing tech CEO, you know, like who's still in their prime, like Amjad of Replit or, uh, you know, Dylan Field of Figma um, or, you know, th those are two who have thought of who are very good and, you know, are, are, will be on top of it. Amjad is very early on integrating AI into Replit and it's basically built that into an AI first company, which is really impressive. Those are folks who cleanly made a pivot. It's as big or bigger than, uh, comparable to, I would say, the pivot from uh, desktop to mobile that broke a bunch of companies in the late 2000s and early 2010s. Like Facebook in 2012 had no mobile revenue roughly at the, at the time of their IPO. And then they had to like redo the whole thing. And it's hard to turn a company 90 degrees when something new like that hits. You know, Those that are run by kind of tech CEOs in their prime uh, will will adapt and will AIify their existing services. And the question is, obviously, there's new things that are coming out, like Pika and Character.ai. There's some like really good stuff that's that's out there. The question is, uh, you know, will the disruption be allowed to happen in the U.S. regulatory environment? And so my view is actually that uh, you know, so this is from like the Network State book, right? I talk about, you know, people talk about a multipolar world or unipolar world. The political axis is actually really important, in my view, for thinking about whether AI will be allowed to disrupt, okay? Because uh, we'll get to this probably later, but the 640K of compute is enough for everyone executive order. You know, 640K of memory, the apocryphal, he didn't, Bill Gates didn't actually say it, but that, that quote kind of gives a certain mindset about computing. That should be enough for everybody. So the 10 to the 26 of compute should be enough for everyone, Bill. Um, I actually think it's very bad. And I think it's just the beginning of their attempts to build like a software FDA, okay, to decelerate, control, regulate, red tape the entire space, just like how, you know, the threat of nuclear terrorism got turned into the TSA, the threat of, you know, terminators and AGI gets turned into a million rules on whether you can set up servers and this last free sector of the economy is strangled or at least controlled within the, the territory controlled by Washington, D.C. Now, why, is, why does this relate to the political? Well, obviously, this you, know, you can just spend your entire life just tracking AI papers, and that's moving like at the speed of light like this, right? What's also happening, as you can kind of see in your peripheral vision, is there's 
political developments that are happening at the speed of light, much faster than have happened in our lifespans. Like there's more, you just notice more wars, more serious online conflicts. Like, you know, there's a sovereign debt crisis. All of those things I can show graph after graph of things looking like their own types of singularities, you know, like military debts are way up. You know, the long piece that Steven Pinker showed, it's looking like a U that's suddenly way up after Ukraine and some of these other wars are happening, unfortunately, right? Um, interest payments, whoosh, way up to the side. What's my point? Point is, I, I think that uh, the world is going to become from the Pax Americana world of just like basically one superpower, hyperpower that we grew up in from 91 to 2021, roughly, that we're going to get a specifically tripolar world, not unipolar, not bipolar, not multipolar, but tripolar. And those three poles, I kind of think of as NYT, CCP, BTC, or you could think of them as, and uh, those are just certain labels that are associated with them, but they're roughly US tech. In the U.S. environment, China tech and the China environment, and global tech and the global environment. And why do I identify BTC and crypto and so on with global tech? Because that's a tech that decentralized out of the U.S. And right now, people think of crypto as finance, but it's also financiers. Okay, and in this next run-up, it is, I think, quite likely about, depending on how you count, between a third to a half of the world's billionaires will be crypto. Okay. Around, you know, I calculated this a while back, around Bitcoin at a few hundred thousands, or around a third to a half of the world's billionaires are crypto. That's the unlocked pool of capital. And those are the people who do not bow to DC or Beijing. And they might, by the way, be Indians or Israelis or every other demographic in the world, or they could be American libertarians, or they could be Chinese liberals like Jack Ma, who are pushed out of Beijing's sphere, okay? Or the next Jack Ma. You know, Jack Ma himself may, <laughs> may not be able to do too much, okay? That group of people who are, let's say, the dissident technologists who are not going to just kneel to anything that comes out of Washington, D.C. or Beijing, that is the, that's decentralized AI, that's crypto, that's decentralized social media. So you can think of it as, you know, where we, we talked about on the recent Pirate Wires podcast, freedom to speak with decentralized censorship resistant social media, freedom to transact with cryptocurrency, freedom to compute with open source AI and no compute limits, okay? That's a freedom movement, and that's like the same spirit as the Pirate Bay, the same spirit as BitTorrent, the same spirit as Bitcoin, the same spirit as peer-to-peer -peer and end-to-end -end encryption. That's a very different spirit than having Kamala Harris regulate a superintelligence or signing it over to Xi Jinping thought. And the reason I say this is, I think that that group of people of which I think Indians and Israelis will be a very prominent, maybe a plurality, right? Just because the sheer quantity of Indians are like the third sort of big group that's kind of coming up. And they're relatively underpriced. You know, China is, I don't want to say it's priced to perfection, but it's something that people, when I say priced, I mean, people were dismissive of China even up until 2019. And then it was after 2020, if you look, that people started to take China seriously. And what I mean by that is the West Coast tech people knew that China actually had a plus tech companies and was a very strong competitor, but the East Coast still thought of them as a third world country until after COVID, when now you know the East Coast was sort of threatened by them politically, and it wasn't just blue collars, but blue America that was threatened by China. And so that's why the reaction to China went from, oh, who cares, it's just taking some manufacturing jobs to this is an empire that can contend with us for control of the world. That's why the hostility is ramped up, in my view. There's a lot of other dimensions to it, but that's a big part of it. So India is also kind of there, but it's like the third. And India is not going to play for number one or number two. But India and Israel, if you look at like tech founders, depending on how you count, especially if you include the diasporas, it's on the order of 30 to 50% of tech founders, right? And it's obviously some, you know, very good tech CEOs and, you know, Satya and Sundar and investors and whatnot. Those are folks, Indians do not want to bow to DC or to Beijing. Neither do Israelis for all kinds of reasons, even if Israel has to, you know, take some direction from the US now, they're bristling at it, right? And, and then a bunch of other countries don't. So the question is, who breaks away? And, and now we get to your point on, the reason I had to say that is that that's preface, the political environment, this tripolar thing of US tech and US regulated, Chinese tech and China regulated, and global tech that's free. Okay, of course there's, even though I identify those three poles, there's of course boundary regions. EAC is actually on the boundary of, of US tech and decentralized tech, you know? 
And I'm sure there'll be some Chinese thing that comes out that is also on the boundary there. For example, Binance is on the boundary of Chinese tech and global and decentralized tech, if that makes any sense, right? And there's probably others. Apple is actually on the boundary of US tech and Chinese tech because they make all of their stuff in China, right? So these are not totally disjoint groups, but there's boundary areas, but, but you can think of them. Why is this third group so important in my view? Both the Chinese group and the decentralized group will be very strong competition for the American group for totally different reasons. China has things like WeChat, these super apps. I mean, obviously not like, but like super WeChat is a super app, but they also have, for example, their digital yuan, right? They have the largest, cleanest data sets in the world that are constantly updated in real time that they can mandate their entire population opt into. And most of the Chinese language speaking people are under their ambit, right? So that doesn't include Taiwan, doesn't include Singapore, doesn't include um, you know some of the Chinese diaspora, but basically anything that's happening in Chinese for 99% of it, 95, whatever the ratio is, they can see it and they can coerce it and they can control it. So they can tell all of their people, okay, here's five bucks in um, you know, digital yuan, do this micro task, okay? All of these digital blue collar jobs, both China and India, I think can do quite a lot with that. And I'll come back to that. So they can make their people do immense amounts of training data, clean up lots of data sets. Once it's clear that you have to build this and do this, they can just kind of execute on that. And they can also deploy. I mean, in many ways, the US is still very strong in digital technology, but in the physical world, it's terrible because of all the regulations, cause all of the NIMBYism and so on. It's not like that in China. So anything which kind of works in the US at a physical level, like the Boston Dynamics stuff, they're already cloning it in China and they can scale it out in the physical world. You already have drones, little, little sidewalk drone things that come to your hotel room and drop things off. That's already like very common in China. In many ways, it's already ahead if you go to the Chinese cities. So the Chinese version of AI is ultra centralized, more centralized, more monitoring, less privacy and so on than the American version. And therefore they will have potentially better data sets, at least for the Chinese population. And so WeChat AI, I don't even know what it's going to be, but it will be probably really good. Okay. It'll also be really dangerous in other ways. Okay. Then the decentralized sphere has power for a different reason because the decentralized sphere can train on full Hollywood movies. It can train on all books, all MP3s and just say, screw all this copyright stuff, right? Like what SciHub and, you know, LibGen are doing because all the copyright, first of all, it's not it's like Disney lobbying politicians to put like another 60 or 70 or 90. I don't even know what it is. Some crazy amount on copyright. So you can keep milking this stuff and it doesn't go into public domain, number one. And second, you know how Hollywood was built in the first place? It was all patent, copyright, and IP violation. Essentially, Edison had all the patents. He's in New Jersey-ish, okay, that the East Coast area. And um, Neil Gabler has this great book called An Empire of Their Own, where he talks about how uh, immigrant populations, you know, the Jewish community in particular, also others, went to Southern California in part so they could just make movies that Edison coming and suing them for all the patents and so on and so forth. And they made enough money that they could fight those battles in court. And that's how they built Hollywood. Okay. So, you know, one of my big theses is history is running in reverse. And I can get to why, but it's like 1950s, a mirror moment. And you go more decentralized backwards and forwards in time is like, these you have these huge centralized states like the U.S. and USSR and and China, you know, all these things exist, and then their fist relaxes as you go forwards and backwards in time. For example, backwards in time, the Western frontier closed, uh, and forwards in time, the Internet frontier opens. Backwards in time, you have the robber barons. Forwards in time, you have the tech billionaires. Backwards in time, you have, you have Spanish flu. Forwards in time, you have COVID nineteen. And I've got dozens of examples of this in the book. The point is that. If you go backwards in time, the ability to enforce patents and copyrights and so on starts dropping off, right? You have much more of a grand theft auto environment. And you go forwards in time and that's happening again. So India in particular, for many years, basically just didn't obey Western patent protections and all these stupid rules. Basically, you know, it's a combination of artificial scarcity on the patent side and artificial regulation on the FDI side. That's a big part of what jacks up drug costs, where these things cost you know only cents to manufacture and they sell them for so much money. Um, all, all the delays, of course, that are imposed on the process, the only way they can pay for it, the manufacturers, is to take it out of your hide. What India did is they just said, we're not going to obey any of that stuff. So they have a whole massive generic drugs and biotech industry that arose 
because they built all the skills for that. That's why they could do their own vaccine during COVID. And they're one of the biggest biotech industries in the world because they said, screw Western restrictive IPs and other stuff, right? So I was actually talking with the, uh, the founder of Flipkart, that's India's largest exit. And we were talking about this a few months ago. And what we want is for India and other countries like it, do something similar, not just generic drugs, but generic AI. Meaning just let people train on Hollywood movies, let them train on full songs, let them train on every book, let them train on anything. And you know what? Sue, sue them in India, right? And have the servers in India and let people also train models in India because that's something that can build up a, a, a domestic industry with skills that the rest of the world, uh, you know, people will want the model output. They'll want to use the, the software service there and they'll be fighting in court on the back end. This is similar to how all of the record companies fought uh, Napster and Kazaa and so on, but they couldn't take down Spotify. Do you know that story? Do you remember that? Basically, because Spotify was legitimately, you know, a European company and that a combination of execution and, you know, negotiation, um, they couldn't take them down. They did take down Napster. They took down LimeWire. They took down GrooveShark. And Kazaa had Estonians. I don't know exactly how it was incorporated, but it's probably too U.S. proximal. And that's why they were able to get them. But Spotify was far enough away that they couldn't just sue them. And they actually genuinely had European traction. That's why the RAA had to negotiate. So being far away from San Francisco may also be an advantage in AI because it means you're far away from the bluest city in the bluest state in the union. This relates to another really important point. When you actually think about deploying AI, there's those jobs that can disrupt that are not regulated jobs. Like, you know, obviously programmers are not, it's, thank God you don't need a license to be a programmer, but programmers adopt this kind of stuff naturally, right? So GitHub Copilot, Replit, we just boom, use it, and now it's amplified intelligence, okay? But a lot of other jobs, there's some that are unionized and then some that are licensed, right? So Hollywood screenwriters are complaining, right? Journalists are complaining, artists are complaining. This is a good chunk of blue America. If you add in licensed jobs like lawyers and doctors and bureaucrats, right? Um, you know, especially lawyers and doctors, very politically powerful MDs and JDs, they have strong lobbying organizations, AMA and, you know, ABA and so on. Basically, AI is part of the economic apocalypse for blue America. Okay. It just attacks these overpriced jobs. And when I say overpriced relative to what an Indian could do with an Android phone, what a South American could do with an Android phone, what someone in the Middle East or the Midwest could do with an Android phone. Now, those folks have, uh, you know, been armed with generative AI. They can do way more. They're ready to work. They're ready to work for much less money. And they're a massive threat to blue America. Blue America is now feeling like the blue collars of 10 or 20 years ago, where um, the blue collars had their jobs, you know, going to China and other places, right? And they were mad about that. Factories got shut down and so on. That's about to happen to blue America. Already happening, okay? And so that's going to mean a political backlash by blue America of protectionism. Again, already happening. And the AI safety stuff, that's a whole separate thing, but it's going to be used. I'm going to use a phrase, and I hope you won't be offended by this. Have you heard the phrase, phrase useful idiots, like by Lenin or whatever? Okay. It basically means like, okay, those guys, uh, you know, they're useful idiots for communism. And so, so there's, uh, let me put it like naive people who think that the U.S. government is interested in AI safety are trying to give a lot of power to the U.S. government. And the reason is they haven't actually thought through from first principles, what is the most powerful actor in the world? I come back to that. They're trying to give power to the US government to regulate AI safety. But the government doesn't care about safety of anything. They literally funded the COVID virus in Wuhan, credibly alleged, right? There's at, it at least it is a reasonable hypothesis based on a lot of the data. Matt, Matt Ridley wrote a whole book on this. There's a lot of data that indicates, a lot of scientists believe it. I'm, I'm actually like a bioinformatics genomics guy. If you look at the sequences, there is a gap and a jump where it looks like this thing could have been engineered or partially engineered or evolved. There's the Peter, you know, Peter Dazak, there's Zeng Li Shi. There's actually a lot of evidence here. So the US government and the Chinese government are responsible for an existential risk. You know, by studying it, they created it. Okay. They're responsible for risking nuclear war with Russia over this, you know, piece of land in eastern Ukraine, which, you know, probably is going to get wound down. Okay. So they don't care about your safety at all. 
They're not like, these are immediate things where we can show, and there's nobody who's punished for this. Nobody is fired for this. You know, literally rolling the dice on millions, hundreds of millions of people's lives has not been punished. In fact, it's like, it's not even talked about. We're past the pandemic and, you know, this these institutions can't be punished. So they don't care about AI safety. What they care about is AI control. And so the people in tech who are like, well, the government will guarantee AI safety. That's actually what we're going to actually get is something on the current path, like what happened with nuclear technology, where you got nuclear weapons, but not nuclear power, or at least not to the scale that we could have had it, right? We could have had much cheaper energy for everything. Instead, we got the militarization and the regulation and the deceleration. Worst of all worlds, where you can blow people up, but you can't build nuclear power plants. And like even getting into nuclear technology, forget, forget about nu just nuclear power plants. We don't have nuclear submarines. We don't have nuclear planes, all that kind of stuff. I don't know if nuclear planes are possible, but I do know nuclear submarines are possible. You can do a lot more cruise ships, a lot more stuff like that. You could probably have nuclear trains. You know, I have to, you have to look at exactly how big those are. You know, not a, uh, I don't know exactly how big those engines are and what the supply is, but I wouldn't be surprised if you could. We don't have that. Why don't we have that? Because we had the wrong fear-driven regulation in the early 70s. Putting it all together, I think that the current AI safety stuff is similar to nuclear safety stuff, that the US government has a terrible track record on safety in general. It doesn't care about it. It funded the COVID virus, credibly alleged. It definitely risked nuclear war with, with Russia recently. Hot war with Russia was the red line we were not supposed to cross, and we're now like way into that. So it doesn't care about AI safety. It doesn't care about your safety. And it's also not even good at regulating. And so what it cares about is control. And we are going to have potentially a bad outcome where Silicon Valley in San Francisco is the Xerox Park of AI. May, maybe that's too strong, okay? But basically, it develops it. And there's a lot of things it can't do because it lobbied for this regulation that is going to come back and choke it. And then the other two spheres will push ahead because it's not about the technology. It's also about the political layer. You know, the Steve Jobs saying, actually, it's Alan Kay by way of Steve Jobs. If you're really serious about software, you need your own hardware, right? So if you're, if you're really serious about technology, you need your own sovereignty. Because... Like what the AI people haven't thought about is there's a platform beneath you, which is not just compute, it is regulate. It's a law, okay? And if the law doesn't allow you to compute, so much for all of your stuff above that. And I know you're saying, oh, it's only a 10 to the 26 compute ban and so on and so forth. Have you seen the first IRS tax form? It's always, always Super simple. It's only the super, super, super rich who's who are going to get in first. Doesn't matter to you. So that's called boiling the frog slowly. There's a million, you know, slippery slope. Slippery slope isn't a fallacy. It's literally how things work, right? You know, Apple. One of the reasons they, you know, they, they talk about not setting a precedent. Zuck starts a is a very hard line on setting precedents because he understands the long term equivalent of setting a precedent, right? The precedent setting is that they're setting up a software FDA. And they're gonna and and DC is so energized on this because they know how much social media disrupted them. That's why they're on the attack on crypto and AI. That's why they're on the attack on self-driving cars. They want to freeze the current social order in amber domestically and globally. So they think they can sanction China and stop it from developing chips. They think they can impose regulations on the US and stop it from developing AI. But they can't. And also, by the way, they're they're totally schizophrenic on this, where when they're talking about China, they're like, we're going to stop their chips to make sure America is a global leader. This is this Gina Raimondo who's saying this. And then domestically, they're like, we're going to regulate you so you stop accelerating AI. We're not about AI acceleration. EAC is weird or whatever. Okay? So think about how schizophrenic that is. Okay, you're going to be far ahead of China. We're also going to be make sure to control the US. So they want to try and slow. What they actually want is to freeze the current system in amber try to go back to pre-2007 before all these tech guys disrupted everything. But that's not what's going to happen. So, But they're going to try to do it. And so everybody who's still loyal to the DC sphere, which includes an enormous chunk of AI people, and uh, because they're all in, a lot of them are in San Francisco, right? And the political chaos of the last few years was not sufficient for them to relocate yet. Not all of them. I mean, Elon is in Texas. And that it may turn out that Grok, for example, and what they're doing there, because he's a very legit, I mean, 
you know, he's, he's Elon, so he's capable of doing a lot. He was very early on OpenAI. He understood, he understands, you know, the right. It may turn out that Grok becomes Red AI or the, the community around that, you know, and OpenAI and DeepMind are still Blue AI. And we have Chinese AI and we're going to have decentralized AI. Okay, let me pause there. I know there's a big download. Well, I, for starters, I would say broadly, I have a pretty similar intellectual you know, tendency as you, I, I would broadly describe myself as a techno optimist libertarian on just about every issue. And I think your analysis of the dynamics is super interesting. And I think it, you know, a lot of it sounds pretty plausible, although I, I'll kind of float a couple things that I think may be bucking the trend. But I think it's maybe useful to kind of try to separate this into scenarios because the all the analysis that you're describing here seem, if I understand it correctly, it seems to have the implicit assumption that the AI itself is not going to get super powerful or hard to control. It's like, if we assume that it's kind of a normal technology, then you're off to the races on this analysis, and then we can get into the fine points. But I do want to take at least one moment and say, are you know, how confident are you on that? Because if it's if it's a totally different kind of technology from other technologies that we've seen, if it's more, you know, you raise the gain of function research, uh, you know, example, if it's, if it's that sort of technology that, you know, has these sort of non-local possible impacts or, you know, self-reinforcing kind of dynamics, which need not be like a, you know, Eliezer style snap of the fingers foom, but even over say a decade, let's imagine that, you know, over the next 10 years that, AIs kind of, you know, multiple architectures develop and they sort of get integrated and we have something that kind of looks like robust silicon based intelligence, you know, maybe not totally robust, but like as robust or more robust than us and running faster and, you know, the kind of thing that can like do lots of full jobs or maybe even be tech CEOs, then it kind of feels like a lot of this analysis probably doesn't hold, right? Because we're just in a totally different regime that is just like extremely hard to predict. And I guess I wonder, like, first of all, do you agree with that kind of just like, there seems to be a big fork in the road there. That's like, just how fast and how powerful do the, how fast do these AIs become super powerful or do they not? And if they don't, then like, yeah, I think we're much more into like real politic type of analysis, but I'm not at all confident in that. To me, it feels like there's a very real chance that, you know, AI of 10 years from now is, and by the way, this is like what the leaders are saying, right? I mean, OpenAI is saying this, Anthropic is saying this, Demis, you know, and Shane Legg are certainly, you know, saying things like this. It seems like they expect that we will have AIs that are more powerful than any individual human and that, you know, that that becomes like the bigger question than anything else. So do you agree with that? kind of division of scenarios, first of all, and then maybe you could kind of say like how likely you think each one is. And obviously that one where they, it takes off is like super hard to analyze. And I, I also definitely think it is worth analyzing the scenario where it doesn't take off. But I just wanted to flag that it seems like there's a, you know, there's a big, if you talk to the AI safety people, any world in which it's like, you know, we're suing Indian AI firms in Indian court over like IP, is like a normal world in their mind, right? And that's not the kind of world that they're most worried about. I think that there have been some plausible sounding things that have been said, but I wanna just kind of talk about a few technical counter arguments, mathematical or physical, that constrain what is possible, okay? And actually, Martin Casado and Vijay and I are working on a long thing on this where, you know, Vijay did folding at home, he's a physicist, Martin sold Nasira for, you know, a billion dollars and and knows a lot about how a Stuxnet like thing could work at the systems level. And I've thought about it from other angles and, you know, um, and, and some of the math stuff which I'll get to. So for example, one thing, and I'm going to give a bunch of different technical arguments and then let's kind of combine them. Okay. One thing that's been talked about is if you have a super intelligence, it can deliberate for a million years and then it can make one move and it's going to outthink you all the time and so on and so forth. Okay. Well, if you're familiar with the math of chaos or the math of turbulence, there are limits to even very simple systems that you can set up where they can become very unpredictable quite quickly. Okay. And so you can, if you want to engineer a system where you have 
very rapid divergence of predictability so that, I don't know, it's like the heat death of the universe before you can predict out in timestamps. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Right. This is sort of akin to like a Wolfram, like simple, even simple rules can generate patterns such that you can't know them without literally computing them. Yeah, exactly. Right. So at least right now with chaos and turbulence, you can get things that are extremely provably difficult to forecast without actually doing it. Okay. You know, I can make that argument quantitative, but that's just something to, to look at, right? It's almost like a delta epsilon challenge from calculus. Like, okay, how hard do you want me to make this to predict? Okay, I can set up a problem that is that is like that, right? It's basically extreme sensitivity to initial conditions lead to extreme divergence in outcomes. So you could design systems to be chaotic that might be AI immune because they can't be forecasted that well. You have to kind of react to them in real time. The ultimate version of this is not even a chaotic system. It's a cryptographic system where... I've got a whole slide deck on this, how AI makes everything fake, easy to fake. Crypto makes it hard to fake again, right? Because crypto in the broader sense of cryptography, but also in the narrower sense, I think crypto is to cryptography as uh, the internet is to computer science. It's like the primary place where all this stuff is applied, but obviously it's not the equivalent, okay? And AI can fake an image, but it can't fake a digital signature unless it can break certain math, you know, and, and, and so it's sort of like a, you know, solve factors, each problem or something like that. So cryptography is another mathematical thing that constrains AI, similar to chaos and turbulence. It constrains how much an AI can infer things. You can't statistically infer it. Okay. You need to actually have the private key to solve that equation. So that is another math. So I'm going to rules of math, right? Math is very powerful because you can make proofs that will work no matter what devices we come up with. Okay, you start to put an AI in a cage. It can't predict beyond a certain amount because of chaos and turbulence math. It cannot uh, solve certain equations unless it has a private key is because of what we know about cryptography, math, okay? Again, if somebody proves P equals NP, some of this stuff breaks down, but this is within the bounds of our mathematical knowledge right now. Physics-wise, physical friction exists. A lot of physical friction exists. And... Uh, a huge amount of the writing on AI assumes by guys like Eliezer, who I like, I don't, I don't dislike, you know, but it is extremely, uh, it, it's, there's two things that really stick out to me about it. First is extremely theoretical and not empirical. And second, extremely Abrahamic rather than Dharmic or Sinic. Okay. Why theoretical and not empirical? It's not trivial to turn something from the computer into a real world thing, okay? One of the biggest gaps in all of this thinking is what are the sensors and actuators, okay? Because like if you actually build, you know, I've, I've built in industrial robot systems that, you know, 10 years ago, I, you know, a genome sequencing lab with robots. That's hard. That's physical friction, okay? And a lot of the AI scenarios seem to basically say, oh, it's going to be a self-programming Stuxnet that's going to escape and live off the land and hypnotize people into doing things, okay? Now, each of those is actually really, really difficult steps. First is self-programming Stuxnet, like this would have to be a computer virus that can live on any device, despite the fact that Apple or Google can push a software update to a billion devices, right? A few executives coordinating almost certainly can, I mean, the off switch exists, right? Like this is actually like the core thing. Lots of AI safety guys get themselves into the mind state that the off switch doesn't exist. But guess what? There's almost nothing living that we haven't been able to kill, right? Like, can we kill it? Th this thing exists, and this again, back to living off the land. A, even if you had like something that could solve some other technical problems that I'll get to, it exists as an electromagnetic wave kind of thing on, on a certain, you know, on, on chips and so on and so forth. It's it, taking it out in the environment is like putting a really smart human into outer space, right? Your body just explodes and you die. It doesn't matter how smart you are. That, that strength on this axis, but you're weak on this axis. And, you know, it's so just strength on the X axis, not strength on the Y or the Z axis. And AI outside, you know, pour water on it. You know, this is why I mean the 50 IQ, 150 IQ thing you know, the 150 IQ way of saying it is it's strong on this X and weak on this X. And the 50 IQ way is pour water on it, disconnect it, you know, turn the power off. Okay. Right. 
Like it'll, it'll be very difficult to build a system where you literally cannot turn it off. The closest thing we have to that is actually not Stuxnet. It's Bitcoin. And Bitcoin only exists because millions of humans keep it going. So you, you need, so that gets to the second point, living off the land. For an AI to live off the land, meaning without human cooperation, okay, that's the next Turing threshold. An AI to live without human cooperation. It would need to be able to control robots sufficient to dig or out of the ground, set up data centers and generators and connect them and defend that against human attack. Literally a Terminator scenario, okay? That's a big leap in terms, I mean, is it completely impossible? I can't say it's completely impossible, but it's not happening tomorrow. No matter what your AI timelines are, you would need to have like a billion or hundreds of millions of internet connected autonomous robots that this Stuxnet AI could hijack that were sufficient to carve ore out of the earth and you know set up data centers and make the AI duplicate. We're not there. That's a huge amount of physical friction. That's AI operating without a human to, to make itself propagate, right? A human doesn't need uh, the cooperation of a, of a lizard to, to self-replicate. For an AI to replicate right now, it would need the cooperation of a human um, in some sense because Otherwise, those humans can kill it because there's not that many different pieces of, you know, operating systems around the world. And I'm just talking about the practical constraints of our current world, right? You know, actually existing reality, not AI safety guys, you know, you know, reality where all these things don't exist. There's just a few operating systems, just a few countries. If everybody's going with torches and searchlights through the internet, it's very hard for a virus to continue, okay? So A, uh, on the practical difficulties, that there's the technical stuff with with you know with the uh, with chaos and turbulence and with cryptography itself where AI can't predict and it can't solve certain equations. B on the physical difficulties, it probably I mean like to be a Stuxnet, Microsoft and Google and so on could kill it. The off switch exists. Can it live off the land? No, it cannot because it doesn't have you know drones to mine ore and stuff out of the ground. And um, can it like exist without humans? Can it be this hypnotizing thing? Okay, so the hypnotizing thing, by the way, this is one of the things that's the most hilarious self-fulfilling prophecy in my view, okay? In my, and no offense to anybody listening to this podcast, but I think the absolutely dumbest kind of tweet that I've seen on AI is, I typed this in and oh my God, it told me this. Like I asked it how to make sarin gas and it told me X or whatever, right? That's just a search engine, okay? What what basically a lot of these people are doing is they're saying, what if there were people out there that were so impressionable that they would type things into an AI and, and follow it as if they were hearing voices? And that's actually not the, the, the model or whatever that's doing it. That's like this AI cult that has evolved around the world, like a Aum Shinrikyo, you know, that, that hears voices and does like the sarin gas. The, the point is an AI can't just like hypnotize people. Those people have to like participate in it. They're typing things into the machine or whatever, okay? Now, you might say, all right, let's project out a few years. In a few years, what you have is you have an AI that is not just text, but it appears as Jesus. What would, what would AI Jesus do? What would AI Lee Kuan Yew do? What would AI George Washington do? So it appears as 3D, okay? So it's generating that. It speaks in your language and in a voice. It knows the history of your whole culture, okay? That would be very convincing. Absolutely be very convincing. But it still can't exist without human programmers who are like the priests tending this AI God, whether it's AI Jesus or AI Lee Kuan Yew or something like that. The thing about the hypnotization thing that I really want to poke on that, are you familiar with the concept of the principal agent problem? Basically, in every every time you've got like a CEO and a, and a, uh, a worker, or you have a LP and a VC, or you have um, you know an, an employer and a contractor, Every edge there, there are four possibilities in a two-by-two two matrix. Win-win, win-lose, lose-win, lose-lose, okay? And uh, so, for example, win-win is, you know, when, when somebody joins a tech startup, the, the CEO makes a lot of money and so does a worker, okay? That's win-win. Lose-lose is they both lose money. Win-lose is the CEO makes money and the employee doesn't. Lose-win is the company fails, but the employee got paid a very high salary. So what equity does is it aligns people that's where the concept of alignment comes from. It aligns people to the upper left corner of win-win. That's when you have one, one CEO and one employee. When you have one CEO and two employees, you don't have 
two squared outcomes, you have two cubed outcomes because you have win, 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 lose, win, lose, lose, et cetera, right? Because all three people can be win or lose. Okay, the CEO can be win or lose, employee can be win or lose, employee number two can be win or lose. If you have N people rather than three people, you have two to the N possible outcomes and you have essentially a two by two by two by two by two by N hypercube of possibilities. Okay, it's all literally just two dimensions on each axis. There's tons of possible defecting kinds of things that happen there. So that's why in a large company, there's lose-win coalitions that happen where M people gang up on the other K people and they win whether other people lose. That's how politics happens. When you've got a startup that's driven by equity and the biggest payoff, people don't have to try to think, okay, well, I make more money by politics. They'll make more money by the win-win-win-win-win column because the exit makes everybody make the most money. That's how, actually how the open AI people were able to coordinate around, we want an $80 billion company. The economics helped find the cell that was actually the most beneficial to all of them, helped them coordinate, okay? So you search that hypercube. Okay, that's a point of equity as lining. Still, despite all of this, that, that's one of our best mechanisms for coordinating large numbers of people in the principal agent problem. Despite all this, the possibility exists for any of these people to win while the others lose, right? With me so far? And I'll explain why this is important. What that means is those thousand employees of the CEO are their own agents with their own payoff functions that are not perfectly aligned with the CEO's payoff function. As such, there are scenarios under which they will defect and do other things. Okay, the only way they become like actual limbs, see my, my hand does not is not an agent of its own. It lives or dies with me. Therefore, it does exactly what I'm saying at this time. I tell it to go up, it goes up. I tell it to go down, it goes down. Sideways, sideways, right? An employee is not like that. They will do this and this and sideways, sideways up to a certain point. And if you, uh, if you have them do something that's extremely against their interests, they will not do your action. Do you understand my point? Okay, that is the difference between an AI hypnotizing humans versus an AI controlling drones. An AI controlling drones is like your hands. They're actually pieces of your body. There's no defecting. There's no lose win. They have no mind of their own. They're literally taking instructions. Okay, they have no payoff function. They will kill themselves for the horde, right? An AI hypnotizing humans has a thousand principal agent problems for every thousand humans, and it has to incentivize them to continue and has to generate huge payoffs. It's like an AI CEO. That's really hard to do, right? The history of evolution shows us how hard it is to coordinate multicellular organisms. You have to make them all live or die as one. Then you get something along these lines. Like an ant colony can coordinate like that because if the queen doesn't reproduce, all the ants, it doesn't matter what they're having sort of genetic material, okay? We are not currently set up for those humans to not be able to reproduce unless the AI reproduces. Do I think we eventually get to a configuration like that? Maybe. Where you have an AI brain is at the center of civilization and it's coordinating all the people around it. And every civilization that makes it is capable of crowdfunding and operating its own AI. That gets me to my other critique of the AI safety guys. I mentioned that the first critique is a very theoretical rather than empirical. And the second critique is they're Abrahamic rather than Dharmic or Sinic. Okay. And, you know, our background culture influences things in ways we don't even think about. So much of the paperclip thinking is like a vengeful God will turn you into pillars of salt, except it's a vengeful, you know, AI God will turn, turn you into paperclips. Okay. The polytheistic model of many gods as opposed to one God is we're all going to have our own AI gods and there'll be war of the gods like Zeus and Hera and so on. That's the closest Western version, you know, the paganism that predated you know, Abrahamic religions, but that's still there in India. That's still how Indians think. That's why India is sort of, people have gotten so woke that they don't even make large scale cultural generalizations anymore. But it's true that India is just culturally more amenable to decentralization, to, you know, multiple gods rather than one God and one state. Okay. And then the Chinese model is yet the opposite. Like they have like, I mean, of course they have their tech entrepreneurs and so on, but they're if India is more decentralized, China is more centralized. They have like one government and one leader for the entire civilization. Okay. And, uh, and that the biggest thing that China has done over the last 20 or 30 years is they've taken various, you know, US things and they've made sure that they have their own Chinese version where they have root. So they take US social media and they made sure they had root over Sina Weibo. Okay. Uh, they make sure they have their own Chinese version of electric cars, the most Chinese version. So the private keys, in a sense, are with G. So that means that they also, at a minimum, you combine these two things, you're at a minimum going to get polytheistic AI of the US and Chinese varieties. And then you add the Indian 
version on it, and you're going to get quite a few of these different AIs around there. And then you have War of the Gods, where maybe they are good at coordinating the humans who who uh, you know t- take instructions from them, but they can't live without the humans, and the humans are giving input to them. That's a series of things I could probably make that clearer if I just laid it out in bullets in, in an essay. But just to recap it, a technical reasons like chaos, turbulence, um, cryptography, why AI is limited in its ability to predict timeframes and to solve equations. B practical limits, an AI cannot easily be a Stuxnet because Microsoft and Google and Apple can install software on a billion devices and just kill it, right? Like basically guys with torches come, all right? It can't easily live off the land without humans because it would need hundreds of millions of autonomous robots out there to control, to mine the ore and, and set up the data centers. It can't just hypnotize humans like it can control drones because of the principal agent problem and the degree of human defection. To make those humans do that, you'd have to have such massive alignment between the AI and humans that the humans all know they'll die if the AI dies and vice versa. We're not there. Maybe we'll be there in like, I don't know, n number of years, but not for a while. That's a total change in like how states are organized. Okay. Finally, let me just talk about the physics a little bit more. There's a lot of stuff which is talked about at a very sci-fi book level of, it'll just invent nanomedicine and nanotech and kill us all and so on and so forth. Now, look, I like Robert Freitas, obviously Richard Feynman's a genius and so on and so forth. But nanotech somehow hasn't been invented yet, okay? Meaning that, you know, there's a lot of chemists that have worked in this area, okay? And a lot of, quote, nanotech is like rebranded chemistry because those are the molecular machines, you know, for example, um, DNA polymerase or ribosome, those are molecular machines that we can get to work at that scale, the evolved ones. To my knowledge, and I may be wrong about this, I haven't looked at it very, very recently, we haven't actually been able to make artificial you know, replicators of the stuff that they're talking about, which means it's possible that there's some practical difficulty that intervened between Feynman and Freitas and so on's calculations, right? Just the sheer fact that those books have came out decades ago and no progress has been made indicates that maybe there's a roadblock that wasn't contemplated, right? So you can't just click your fingers and say, boom, nanomus. And it's sort of like clicking your fingers and saying, boom, time travel. Right? Nanomus and exists. That was that was a good poke that I had a while ago in a conversation like this. Where the AI guy, AI safety guy on the other side was like, well, well, time travel, that's too implausible. I'm like, yeah, but you're waiting on, on the nanotech thing you're thinking is like here, and you're making so many assumptions there that I want to actually see some more work there. I want to actually see that nanotech is actually more possible than, than you think it is. Uh, as for, oh, we just need to mix things in a beaker and make a you know virus and so on so forth. You know what is really, really good at defending against novel viruses? Like the human immune system, that's something that's within envelope right? Like you have evolved to not die and to fight off viruses. Is it possible that maybe you could make some super virus? I mean, maybe, but again, like humans are really good and the immune system is really good at that kind of thing. That is what we're set up to do, right? To adapt to that. Billions of years of evolution have been set up for that. Physical constraints are not really contemplated when people talk about these super powerful AIs. Mathematical constraints, practical constraints are not contemplated. And I could give more, but I think that was a lot right there. Let me pause right there. Yeah, let me try to steel man a few things. And then I do think, you know, it's before too long, I want to kind of get back to the somewhat less, you know, radically transformative scenarios and ask a few follow-up questions on that too. But I think for starters, I would say the the sort of Eliezer, you know, he's updated his thinking over time as well. And I would say probably doesn't get quite enough credit for it because he's definitely on record, you know, repeatedly saying, yeah, I was kind of, expecting more something from like the deep mind school to pop out and be, you know, wildly overpowered very quickly. And on the contrary, it seems like we're in more of a slow takeoff type of scenario where, you know, we've got these, again, like super high surface area, kind of suck up all the knowledge, gradually get better at everything. Some surprises in there, you know, certainly some emergent properties, if you will accept that term, you know, surprise surprises to the developers, if nothing else, right, that are Definitely things we don't fully understand, but it does seem to be a, you know, more gradual turning up of, of capability versus some like, you know, super sudden uh, surprise. But, okay, so then what is the alternative? I, I you know, I'm going to try to kind of give you the, what I, what I think of as the most consensus, strongest scenario where humans lose track of the future. 
and or lose control of the future. Maybe starting by kind of losing track of the present and then having that kind of, you know, give way to losing control of the future. And I think within that, by the way, the I'm not really one who cares that much about like whether AIs say something offensive today. I'm not easily offended and like whatever. That, that's not that's not world ending. I understand your point. That's not like who cares? Whatever. That's within scope. That's within envelope. Within within this bigger kind of, you know, what is the real, you know, most likely path to like AI disaster as understood, I think, by the smartest people today. I think that is still a useful leading indicator because it's like, okay, the developers. You know, whether you agree with their politics, whether you agree with their whether you think their commercial reasons are their sincere reasons or not, they have made it a goal to get the AI to not say certain things. Right. They don't want it to be offensive. The most naive, you know, kind of down the fairway interpretation of that is like, hey, they want to sell it to corporate customers. They know that their corporate customers don't want, you know, to have their AI saying offensive things. So they don't want to say offensive things. And yet they can't really control it. It's like still pretty easy to break. So I view that as just kind of a leading indicator of, okay, we've seen GPT-2, 3, and 4 over the last four years, and that's, you know, a big delta in capability. How much control have we seen developed in that time, and does it seem to be keeping pace? And my answer would be, on the face of it, it seems like the answer is no. You know, we, we don't have the ability to really dial in the behavior such that we can say, okay, you're going to, you know, you can expect, you can trust that these AIs will like not do, you know, A, B, and C. On the contrary, it's like, if you're a little clever, you know, you can get them to do it. You can break out of the sandbox on it. Yeah. And it's, it's not even like, I mean, we've talked about, you know, things where you have access to the weights and you're doing like counter optimizations, but you don't even need that. You know, the kind of stuff I do in like my red teaming in public is literally just like feed the AI a couple of words put a couple words in its mouth, you know, and it will kind of carry on from there. So with that in mind, it's just a leading indicator. You know, I don't know how powerful the most powerful AI systems get over the next few years, but it seems very plausible to me that it might be as powerful as like an Elon Musk type figure, you know, somebody who's like really good at thinking from first principles, really smart, you know, really dynamic across a wide range of different contexts. And, you know, he's not powerful enough to like, in and of himself take over the world, but he is kind of becoming transformative. Now imagine that you have that kind of system and it's trivial to replicate it. So, you know, if you have like one Elon Musk, all of a sudden you can have arbitrary, you know, functionally arbitrary numbers of Elon Musk power things that are clones of each other. I, maybe I can pause you there. So that's my polytheistic AI scenario. But here's the thing that is, this is background, but I want to push it to foreground. You still have a human typing in things into that thing. The human is doing the jailbreak, right? What we're talking about is not artificial intelligence in the sense of something separate from a human, but amplified intelligence. Amplified intelligence, I very much believe in. The reason is amplified intelligence. So here's something that people may not know about humans. There's this great book, uh, Cooking Made Us Human. Okay, tool use has shifted your biology in the following way. For example, and I'll, I'll, I'll map it to the present day. This book by Richard Rangham, Cooking Made Us Human, where the fact that we started cooking and using fire meant that we could do metabolism outside the body, which meant it freed up uh, energy for more brain development, okay? Similarly, developing clothes meant that we didn't have to evolve as much fur. Again, more energy for brain development. Evolving tools meant we didn't have as much fangs and claws and muscles. Again, more energy for brain development, right? So encephalization quotient rose as tool use meant that we didn't have to do as much natively and we could push more to the machines. In a very real sense, we have been a man-machine symbiosis since the invention of fire and the stone ax and clothes, right? You do not exist as a human being on your own. Like the entire Ted Kaczynski concept of like living in nature by itself. Humans are social organisms that are adapted to working with other humans and using tools. And you have for, and we have been for millennia. Okay. This goes back, not just human history, but like hundreds of thousands of years before hunter gatherers are using tools. Okay. So what that means is man-machine symbiosis is not some new thing. It's actually the old thing 
that broke us away from other primate lineages that weren't using tools, okay? This is the fundamental difference between what I call Uncle Ted and Uncle Fred. Uncle Ted is Ted Kaczynski. It's a Unabomber. It's a Doomer. It's a decelerator, the degrowther, who thinks we need to go back to Gaia and Eden and become monkeys and live in the jungle like, like you know, Ted Kaczynski, right? The, the, uh, the Unabomber style. Uncle Fred is Friedrich Nietzsche, right? Nietzschean, we must be- get to the stars and become Ubermen and so on and so forth. This, I think, is going to become, and I actually tweeted about this years ago before the current AI debates, the you know, between anarcho-primitivism, degrowth, deceleration, okay, on the one hand, and transhumanism and acceleration and human 2.0 and human self-improvement and make it to the stars on the other hand, this is the, the future political axis, the current one. And roughly speaking, you can it's not really left and right because you will have both left status and right conservatives go over here. You know, left status will say it's against the state and the right states will say, the right conservatives will say it's against God, okay? And you'll have left libertarians and right libertarians over here where left libertarians say it's my body and, uh, you know, the right libertarians say it's my, you know, my money, right? Um, and so that is a re-architecting of the political axis where, you know, Uncle Ted and Uncle Fred, which is a kind of clever way of putting it, okay? And the problem with the Uncle Ted guys, in my view, is, as I said, yeah, if they go and want to live in the, you know, the woods, fine, go get them. But once you start having even like a thousand, forget a thousand, a hundred people doing that, your your trees will very quickly get exfoliated. You know, the, the leaves are going to get all picked off of them. Humans are not set up to just literally live in the jungle right now. You've had hundreds of thousands of years of evolution that have driven you in the direction of tool use, social organisms, farming, et cetera, et cetera. The man-machine symbiosis is not today. It's yesterday and the day before and 10,000 years ago and 100,000 years ago. And how do we know we've got man-machine symbiosis? Can you live without, uh, even if you're not living, even if you're not using the stove, somebody's using a stove to make you food, right? Can you live without the tractors that are digging up the grains? Can you live without um, indoor heating? Can you live without your clothes? Frankly, can you do your work without your phone, without your computer? No, you can't. You are already a man-machine symbiosis. Once we accept that, then the question is, what's the next step? And right now, we're in the middle of that next step which is AI is amplified intelligence. So what you're talking about is not that the AI is Elon Musk. It is that the AI human fusion means there's another 20 Elon Musks or whatever the number is, okay? And that's good, that's fine, that's within envelope. That's just a bunch of smarter humans on the planet that is amplified intelligence. That is more like, uh, you know, I mentioned the tool thing, okay? The other analogy would be like a dog. You know, a dog is man's best friend, right? So that AI does not live without you. Humans can turn it off. They have to power it. They have to give it subsidence, right? Eventually, that might become like a ceremonial thing. Like, this is our God that we pray to, right? Because it's wiser and smarter than us, and it appears in an image. But the priests maintain it. You know, just like you you go to a Hindu temple or something like that, and the priest will pour out the ghee, you know, for the fires and so on and so forth. And then everybody comes in and prays, okay? The priests believe in the whole thing, but they also maintain the back of the house. They do the system administration for the temple. Same, you know, in, in a Christian church, right? The, 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 you know, like, it's not like it appears out of nowhere. Somebody, you know, uh, uh, went and, and, and assembled this cathedral, right? They saw the back of the house, the fact that it was just woods and rocks and so on that came together. But then when people come there, it feels like a spiritual experience. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. So the equivalent of that, the priests uh, or the, uh, the, you know, the people maintaining temples, cathedrals, mosques, whatever, is um, engineers who are maintaining these future AIs, which appear to you as Jesus. They appear to you maybe even a hologram. Okay, you come there, you ask it for guidance as an oracle. You've also got the personal version on your phone. You ask it for guidance, but guess what? Uh, You're still a human AI symbiosis until and unless that AI actually has the Terminator scenario where it's got lots of robots and it can live on its own. I'm not saying that's physically impossible. I did give some constraints on it earlier, but for a while, we're not going to be there. So that alone means it's not foom because we don't have lots of drones running around. The AI has to be with the human. It's a human AI symbiosis. It's not AI Elon Musk. It is human AI fusion that becomes Elon Musk. And frankly, that's not that different from what Elon Musk himself is. Elon Musk would not be Elon Musk without the internet. 
Without the internet, he can't tweet and reach 150 million people. The internet itself made Elon what he is, right? And uh, and so this is like the next version of that. Maybe there's now 30 Elons because the AI makes the next 30 Elons. Yeah, I mean, again, I think I'm largely with you with just this one very important nagging worry that's like, what if this time is different? Because what if these systems are getting so powerful so quickly that we don't really have time for that techno human fusion to really work out? And I'll just give you kind of a couple data points on that. Like, you know, you said like, it's still somebody putting something into the AI. Well, sort of, right? I mean, already we have these proto agents and the like super simple scaffolding of an agent is just run it in a loop, give it a goal and have it kind of pursue some like plan, act, get feedback and and loop type of structure, right? It doesn't take, it doesn't seem to take a lot. Now they're not smart enough yet to accomplish big things in the world, but it seems like the, the language model to agent switch is less one right now that is gated by the structure or the architecture and more one that's just gated by the fact that like the language models when framed as agents just aren't that successful at like doing practical things and, and getting over humps. So they, they tend to get stuck, but it doesn't seem that hard to imagine that like, you know, if you had something that is sort of that next level that you put it into a loop, you say, okay, you're Elon Musk LLM and your job is to like make, you know, us, whatever us exactly is a, a, you know, multi-planetary species. And then you just kind of, Keep updating your status. Keep up updating your plans. Keep trying stuff. Keep getting feedback, and you know, like what really limits that? There may be like a really good program, but the whole AI kills everyone thing is so. It's like, where's the actuator? Okay, I hit enter. What kills me? Right? Is it a hypnotized human who's being hypnotized by an AI that he's typed into? And he's radicalized himself by typing into a computer. Okay, that's not that different from a lot of other things that have happened in the past, right? So who is actually striking me, right? Who's striking the human? It's another human with an ax that he's been radicalized by an AI, okay? He's not, actually, that's not even the right term. We're giving agency to the AI when it's not really an agent. It is a human who is self-radicalized by typing into a computer screen and has hit another human. That's one scenario. The other scenario is it's literally a Skynet drone that's hitting you. Those are the only two. How else is it going to be physical, right? How does the AI, the actuation step is a part that is skipped over and it's a non-trivial step. Well, I think it could be lots of things, right? I mean, if it's not one of those two, if it's not another human or a drone hitting you, what is it? Uh, just habitat degradation, right? I mean, how do we kill most of the other species that we drive to extinction? We don't go out and like hunt them down with axes one by one. We just like, change the environment more broadly to the point where it's not suitable for them anymore and they don't have enough space and they kind of die out, right? Like, so we did hunt down some of the megafauna, like literally one by one with, with spears and stuff. But like most of the recent loss of species is just like, we're out there just extracting resources for our own purposes. And in the course of doing that, you know, whatever bird or whatever, you know, thing just kind of loses its place and then it's no more. And I don't think that's like totally implausible. Wait, so so that is though, I think within normal world, right? What does that mean? That means that some people, some some amplified intelligence, and maybe we might call it HAI, okay, human plus AI combination, right? Some HAIs outcompete others economically and they lose their jobs. Is that what you're talking about? I think also the humans potentially become unnecessary in a lot of the configurations, like just a recent paper from DeepMind. Zero marginal product workers. Or negative, yeah. I mean, the, yeah, so there's sure. a, the last, you know, DeepMind has been on Google, Google DeepMind has been on a tear of increasingly impressive medical AIs. Their most recent one takes a bunch of difficult case studies from the literature. I mean, case studies, you know, this is like rare diseases, hard to diagnose stuff, and asks an AI to do the differential diagnosis compares that to human and compares it to human plus AI. And they they phrase their results like in a very understated way. But the, the headline is the AI blows away the human plus AI. The human makes the AI worse. So here's the thing. Do, and I'll say something provocative maybe. Okay, like I have in a way, fine. I do think that the ABCs of economic apocalypse for blue America are AI, Bitcoin, and China, where AI takes away 
their a lot of the revenue streams, the licensures that have made uh, medical and legal costs and other things so high. Bitcoin takes away their power over money, and China takes away their military power. So I I foresee total meltdown for Blue America um, in the years and you know maybe decade to come. Already kind of happening, but that's different than being at the end of the world, right? Like Blue America had a really great time for a long time, and they've got these licensure locks. But because of that, they've hyperinflated the cost of medicine. It's like how much how so what you're talking about is wow, we have infinite free medicine. Man, doctor billing events are going to get a hit. That's the point. Yeah, and, and to be clear, I'm really with you on that too. Like I want to see one of the things when people say, like, what is good about AI? You know, why should we why should we pursue this? This my standard answer is high quality medical advice for everyone at pennies, you know, per visit, right? It is orders of magnitude cheaper. We're already starting to see that in some ways it's better. People prefer it, you know, that AI is more patient, it has better bedside manner. Uh, I wouldn't say, you know, if I was giving my, you know, my own family advice today, I would say use both a human doctor and an AI, but definitely use the AI as part of your mix. Absolutely, that's right, that's right. But you're prompting it still, right? The smarter you are, the smarter the AI is. You notice this immediately with your vocabulary, right? The more sophisticated your vocabulary, the finer the distinctions you can have, the better your own ability to spot errors, you can generate a basic program with it, right? But really amplified intelligence is, I think, a much better way of thinking about it because whatever your IQ is, it surges it upward by a factor of three or whatever the number. And maybe the amplifier increases with your intelligence, but that that in, internal intelligence difference still exists. It's just like what a computer is. A computer is an amplifier for intelligence. If you're smart, you can hit enter and programs can go to, like, like think about the Minecraft guy, right? Or Satoshi. One person built a billion or in such a case, trillion dollar thing, you know, obviously other people continued Bitcoin and so on and so forth, right? So the, the, what I feel though is this is what I mean by going from nuclear terrorism to the TSA, okay? We went from AI will kill everyone. And I'm like, what's the actuator? To, okay, it'll gradually degrade our environment. What does that mean? Okay, some people will lose their jobs, but then we're back in normal world. Well, yeah, hold on. Let me paint a little bit more complete picture because I don't think we're quite there yet. So- I think the the differential diagnosis recent paper that's just a data point where it's kind of you know like chess this you know this came long before right there was a period where humans are the best chess players then there was a period where the best were the hybrid human AI systems and now as far as I understand it we're in a regime where the human can't really help the AI anymore and so the AIs are you know the best chess players are just pure AIs we're not there in medicine but we're starting to see examples where hey, in a pretty defined study, differential diagnosis, the AI is beating, not just beating the humans, but also beating the AI human hybrid or the human with access to AI. So, okay, that's not it, right? There's a paper recently called Eureka out of NVIDIA. This is Jim Fan's lab where they use GPT-4 to write the reward functions to train a robot. So you, you want to train a robot to like twirl a pencil in fingers hard, you know, hard for me to do. Robots definitely can't do it. How do you train that? Well, you need a reward function. The reward function, basically, while you're in the early process of learning and failing all the time, the reward function gives you encouragement when you're on the right track, right? So you, there are people who, you know, have developed this skill and you might do something like, well, if the pencil has angular momentum, you know, then that seems like you're on maybe sort of the right track. So give that, you know, a reward, even though at the beginning, you're just failing all the time. Turns out GPT-4 is way better than, than humans at this, right? So it's it's better at training robots. So all of that is awesome and it's great. And But here is, here's the thing is there's a huge difference between AI is going to kill everybody and turn everybody into paper clips, okay, versus some humans with some AI are going to make a lot more money and some people are going to lose their jobs. Yeah, I'm not scared of that. I'm not scared of that scenario. I mean, it could be disruptive. It could be disruptive, but it's not existential unto itself. Bingo. Okay, so that's why I went, right. There's a, the, the beta, to me, it comes, if I, if I ask just one question is, what is the actuator, right? You know, sensors and actuators, right? What is the thing that's actually going to plunge a, a knife or a bullet into you and kill you? It is either a human who has hypnotized themselves by typing into a computer, like basically an AI terrorist, you know, which is, 
kind of where some of the EAs are going, in my view. Or it is like an autonomous drone that is controlled in a StarCraft or Terminator-like way. We are not there yet in terms of having enough humanoid or autonomous drones that are internet connected and programmable. That won't be there for some time, okay? So that alone means fast takeoff is, and what I think by the time we get there, you will have uh, cryptographic control over them. That's a crucial thing. Cryptography fragments the whole space in a very fundamental way. If you don't have the private keys, you do not have control over, the, so long as that piece of hardware the cryptographic controller, you've nailed the equations on that. And frankly, you can use AI to attack that as well to make sure the code is perfect, right? Crypto, remember you talked about attack and defense? AI is attack, crypto is defense, right? Because um, one of the things that crypto has done, do you know what the PKI problem is, public key infrastructure? I'll say no on behalf of the audience. This is a good, we should do more of these actually. I feel it's a good you know, fusion of things or whatever, right? But the public key infrastructure problem, the, the public key infrastructure problem is something that was sort of lots of cryptography papers and computer science papers in the 90s and 2000s assumed that this could exist. And essentially meant if you could assume that everybody on the internet had a uh, public key that was public and a private key that was kept both secure and available at all times, then there's like all kinds of amazing things you can do with privacy preserving, messaging, and authentication, and so on. The problem is that for many years, what, what cryptographers have tried to do is they try to nag people into keeping their private keys secure and available. And the issue is it's trivial to keep it secure and unavailable where you write it down, you put it into a lockbox, and you lose the lockbox. It's trivial to keep it available and not secure, okay, where you, uh, you put it on your public website and... It's available all the time. You never lose it, but it's it's not secure because anybody can see it. When you actually ask, what does it mean to keep something secure and available? That's actually a very high cost. It's precious space because it's basically your wallet, right? Your wallet is on your person at all times, so it's available, but it's not available to everybody else, so it's secure. So you actually have to like touch it constantly, yes, right? So it turns out that the crypto wallet by adding a literal incentive to keep your private keys secure and available. Because if they're not available, you've lost your money. If they're not secure, you've lost your money, okay? To have both of them, that was what solved the PKI problem. Now we have hundreds of millions of people with public private key pairs where the private keys are secure and available. That means all kinds of cryptographic schemes, zero knowledge stuff, there's this amazing universe of things that is happening now Zero knowledge in particular has made cryptography much more programmable. It's a whole topic, which is, uh, if you want something that's kind of, you know, like AI was creeping for a while and people, specialists were paying attention to it and then just burst out on the scene. Zero knowledge is kind of like that for cryptography. Thanks to the, you know, what, you've probably heard of zero knowledge before. Yeah, we did one episode with um, Daniel Kang on the use of zero knowledge proofs to basically to prove without revealing like the weights that you actually ran the model you said you were going to run and things like that, I think are super interesting. Exactly. Right. So what kinds of stuff, why is that useful in the AI space? Well, first is you can use it, for example, for training on medical records while keeping them both private, but also uh, getting the data you want out of it. For example, let's say you've got a collection of um, genomes. Okay. And you want to ask okay, how many G's were in this data set? How many uh, C's, how many A's, how many T's? Okay, like you just say, like, that's very simple now. So what's the ACGT content of this, you know, uh, of the sequence data set? You could get those numbers. You could prove that they were correct without giving any information about the individual sequences, right? Or more specifically, you do it at one locus and you say, how many G's and how many C's are at this particular locus and you get the SNP distribution, okay? So, um, so it's useful for... What you just said, which is like showing that you ran a particular model without giving anything else away. It's useful for uh, certain kinds of data analysis. It, 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 there's a lot of overhead on compute on this right now. So it's not something that you do trivially, okay? But it'll probably come down with time. But what is perhaps most interestingly useful for is um, in the context of, of AI is coming up with things an AI can't fake. So what we talked about earlier, right? Like an AI can come up with all kinds of plausible sounding images, but if it wasn't cryptographically signed, 
by um, the sender, uh, then um, you know it, it uh, and it's it, it should be signed by the sender and put on chain. And then at least you know that this person or this entity with this private key asserted that this object existed at this time in a way that'd be extremely expensive to falsify because it's either on the Bitcoin blockchain or another blockchain that's very expensive to rewind, okay? This starts to be a bunch of facts that an AI can't fake. You know, so the, going back to the, the kind of big picture loss of control story, I was just kind of trying to build up a few of these data points that like, hey, look at this, differential diagnosis. We already see like humans are not really adding value to AIs anymore. That's kind of striking. And like similarly with training robot hands, GPT-4 is outperforming human experts. And by the way, all of the sort of latent spaces are like totally bridgeable, right? I mean, one of the most striking observations of the last couple of years of study is that AIs can talk to each other in high dimensional space, which we don't really have a way of understanding natively, right? We, it takes a lot of work for us to decode. This is like the language thing? It, we're starting to see AIs kind of develop not obviously totally on their own as of now, but we are, there is becoming an increasingly reliable go-to set of techniques if you want to bridge different modalities with like a pretty small parameter adapter. That's interesting. Actually, what's a good paper on that? I actually hadn't seen that. The blip family of models out of Salesforce research is really interesting. And I've used that in production at- Salesforce, really? Yeah, Salesforce research. They have a, a crack team that has open sourced a ton of stuff in the uh, language model computer vision joint space. And this, this, you see this all over the place now, but basically what they did in the paper called blip two, and they've had like five of these with a bunch of different techniques, but in blip two, they took a pre-trained language model and then a pre-trained computer vision model. And they were able to train just a very small model that kind of connects the two. So you could take an image, put it into the image space, then have their little bridge, bridge that over to language space. And that everything else, the, the two big models are frozen. So they were able to do this on just like a couple days worth of GPU time, which I do think goes to show how it is gonna be very difficult to contain proliferation. Which is good. I, in my view, that's really good. As long as it doesn't get out of control, I'm, I am probably with you on that too. Um, but by bridging this vision space into the language space, then the language model would be able to converse with you about the image, even though the language model was never trained on images, but you just had this connector that kind of bridges those modalities. It's just, it's like another layer of the network that just bridges two networks almost. Yeah, it, it bridges the spaces. It, like it bridges the conceptual spaces between something that has only understood images and something that has only understood language, but now you can kind of bring those together. As I think about it, it's not that surprising because that's what, you know, for example, text to image models are basically that. They're bridging two spaces, you know, in a sense, right? But I'll check this paper out. So that so on the one hand, it's not that surprising. On the other hand, I should see how they implemented it or whatever. So blip two. Okay. Yeah, I think the the most striking thing about that is just how small it is. Like you took these two off-the-shelf models that were trained independently for other purposes. And you're able to bridge them with a relatively small connector. And that seems to be kind of, you know, happening all over the place. I would also look at the Flamingo architecture, which is like a year and a half ago now out of DeepMind. That was a one for me where I was like, oh my, and it's also a, a language to vision where they keep the language model frozen. And then they kind of, in my mind, it's like, I can see the person in their garage, like tinkering with their soldering iron, you know, cause it's just like, wow, you took this whole language thing that was frozen and you kind of injected some, you know, vision stuff here and you added a couple layers and you kind of Frankensteined it and it works. And it's like, wow, that's not really, it wasn't like super principled, <laughs> you know, it was just kind of hack a few things together and, you know, try training it. And I don't want to diminish what they did because I'm sure there were, you know, more insights to it than that. But it seems like we are kind of seeing a reliable pattern of the key point here being, model to model communication through high dimensional space, which is not mediated by human language is I think one of the reasons that I would expect. And by the way, there's lots of papers too on like, you know, language models are human level or even superhuman prompt engineers, you know, they're, they're self prompting, like techniques are getting pretty good. So if I'm imagining the big picture of like, 
And then we can, you know, get back to like, okay, well, how do we use any techniques, crypto or otherwise, to keep this under control? And I would say this is kind of the newer school of the big picture AI safety worry. Obviously, there's a lot of flavors. But if you were to, you know, go look at like Ajaya Katra, for example, I think is a really good writer on this. Her worldview is less that we're going to have this foom and more that over a period of time, and it may not be a long period of time, maybe it's like a generation, maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 100 years. But obviously, those are all small in the sort of, you know, grand scheme of the future. We have, in all likelihood, the development of AI centric schemes of production, where you've got kind of your high level executive function is like your language model. You've got all these like lower level models. They're all bridgeable. All the spaces are bridgeable in high dimensional form where they're not really mediated by language unless we enforce that. I mean, we could say, you know, it must always be mediated by language so we can read the logs. But there's a tax to that, right? Because going through language is like highly compressed compared to the high dimensional space to space. All right. So let me see if I can steal man or articulate your case. You're saying... AIs are going to get good enough. They're going to be able to communicate with each other good enough and they're going to be able to do enough tasks that more and more humans will be rendered economically marginal and unnecessary. I'm not saying I think that will happen. I'm just saying I think there's a good enough chance that that will happen that it's worth taking really seriously. I actually think that will happen, something along those lines, uh, or in the sense of at least massive economic disruption, definitely. Okay. But I'll give an answer to that, which is both, you know, maybe fun and not fun. Have you seen the. Um, You've seen the graph of the percentage of America that was involved in farming? Yeah, I tweeted a version of that once. Oh, you did? Okay, great. Good. So you're familiar with this, and you're familiar with what I mean by the implication of it, where basically Americans used to identify themselves as farmers, right? And um, manufacturing rose as agriculture collapsed, right? And here is the, um, the graph on that. But from like 40% in the year 1900 to like a total collapse of agriculture, and then also more recently a collapse of manufacturing into bureaucracy, paperwork, legal work. What is up and to the right since then is, uh, you know, the, um, the, the lawyers. What is up and to the right? What is replacing that? Starting in around the 1970s, um, we used to be adding energy production and energy production flatlined once people got angry about nuclear power. So this is a future that could have been, we could be on Mars by now, but we got flatlined, right? What did go up and to the right, so construction costs, this is the bad scenario where the miracle energy got destroyed because regulations, it, the cost was flat, and then went vertical when regulations were imposed, all the progress was stopped by decels and degrowthers. And then Alara was implemented, which said nuclear energy has to be as low risk as, as reasonably necessary as reasonably achievable. And that meant that you just keep adding, quote, safety to it until it's the same as cost as everything else, which means you destroy the, the value of it, right? Um, but you know what was up and to the right? What replaced those agriculture and manufacturing jobs? Look at this. You see this graph? For the audio only, we will put this on YouTube. So if you want to see the graph, do the YouTube version of this. For the audio only group, it's an exponential curve in the number of lawyers in the United States from looks like maybe two thirds of a million to 13 million over the last 140 years. Yeah, and in 1880, it was like like sub 100,000 or something like that, right? And then it's just like, especially that 1970 point, that's when it went totally vertical, okay? And it's probably even more since it, so, you know, if you add paperwork jobs, bureaucratic jobs, you know, every lawyer is like, you know, ne sorry lawyers, but you're basically negative value add, right? Because it should, the fact that you have a lawyer means that, you couldn't just self-serve a form, right? Basically, government is platform is where you can just self-serve and you fill it out and you don't have to have somebody like code something for you custom. You know, lawyers that's doing custom code is because the, co the legal code is so complicated. So, you know, the, the, the whole Shakespeare thing, like first thing we do, let's, you know, kill all the lawyers. First thing we do, let's automate all the lawyers, right? Only something that's the hammer blow of AI can... Break the backbone, uh, and it will. That's the, it's going to break the backbone of blue America, right? It's going to cause. That's why the political layer and the sovereignty layer is not what AI people think about, but it's like crucial for thinking about AI. Because what tribes does AI benefit? Um, and again, we got away from why does AI kill everybody? Well, it's going to need actuators. Who's going to stab you? Who's going to shoot you? It's got to be a human hypnotized by AI or a drone that AI controls. 
a human hypnotized by AI is actually a conventional threat. It looks like a terrorist cell. We know how to deal with that, right? It's just like radicalized humans that worship some AI that stab you. It's like the pause AI people are one step, I think, away from that, all right? But that's just like Am Shinriko. That's like Al-Qaeda. That's like basically terrorists who think that the AI is telling them what to do, fine? If it's not a human that's stabbing you, it is uh, a drone. And that's like a very different future where like five or 10 or 15 years out, maybe we have enough internet connected drones out there, but even then they'll have private keys. So there's going to be fragmentation of address space. Not all drones be controllable by everybody in my view. Okay. That's what AI safety is. AI safety is, can you turn it off? Can you kill it? Can you uh, stop it from controlling drones? That's what AI safety is. It, can you also open the model weights so you can generate adversarial inputs? Um, can you open the model weights and proliferate it? You're saying, oh, proliferation is bad. I'm saying proliferation is good because if everybody has one, then nobody has an advantage on it, right? Not, not relatively speaking, okay? I have very few super confident positions. So I wouldn't necessarily say I think that proliferation is bad. I'd say so far, it's good. It has, and even the, most of the AI safety people, I would say, if I could you know, speak on the behalf of the AI safety consensus, I would say most people would say even that the Llama 2 release has proven good for AI safety for the reasons that you're saying. But they opposed it. Well, some did and some didn't. I would say the main posture that I see AI safety people taking is that we're getting really close to, or we might be getting really close. Certainly, if we just kind of naively extrapolate out recent progress, it would seem that we're getting really close to systems that are sufficiently powerful that it's very hard to predict what happens if they proliferate. Llama 2, not there. And so, you know, yes, it has enabled a lot of interpretability work. It has enabled things like representation engineering, which there is a lot of good stuff that has come from it. The big thing that I want to kind of establish is you agree with me on the actuation point or not. Like the, the, the thing is this thing, like, oh, Llama 2 proliferates and so businesses are disrupted and people, you know, may, maybe they, they paid a lot of money for their MD degree and they can't make as much money. That's within the realm of what I call conventional warfare. You know what I mean? That's like we're still in normal world as we were talking about, okay? Unconventional warfare is, uh, you know, Skynet arises and kills everybody, okay? And that is what is being sold over here. And, I, and when you think about the actuators, we don't have the drones out there. We don't have the humanoid robots that can control. And hypnotized humans are a very tiny subset of humans, probably. And even if they aren't, that just looks like a religion or a cult or a terrorist cell, and we know how to deal with that as well. The super intelligent AI with a, a, you know lots of robots that can control in a StarCraft form, I would agree, is something that humans haven't faced yet. But by the time we get that many robots out there, you, you won't be able to control all of them at once because of the private keys things I mentioned. So that's why I'm like, okay, everything else we're talking about is in normal world. That's, that is the single biggest thing that I wanted to get. Like economic disruption, people losing jobs, proliferation so that the balance of power is redistributed, all that's fine. The, other, the reason I say this is people keep trying to link AI to existential risk. A great example is one of the things you actually had in here. This is similar to the AI policy and thing. And it's a totally reasonable question, but then I'm going to, in my view, deconstruct the question. What would you think about putting a limit on the right to compute? Are there capabilities an AI system might demonstrate that would make you think open access is no longer wise? Most common near-term answer here to be seems to be related to risk of pandemic via novel pathogen engineering. So guess what? You know who the novel pathogen engineers are? The US and Chinese governments, right? They did it, or probably did it, credibly did it, credibly being accused of doing it. They haven't been punished for COVID-19. In fact, they covered up their culpability and pointed everywhere other than themselves. They used it to gain more power in both the US and China, with both lockdown in China and in the US, and all kinds of COVID era, trillions of dollars was printed and spent and so on and so forth. They did everything other than actually solve the problem that was actually getting you know the vaccines in the private sector. And they studied the existential risk only to generate it. And they're even paid to generate pandemic prevention and failed. So this would be the ultimate fox guarding the hen house. Okay. The only reason the, the two organizations responsible for killing millions of people with novel pathogen are going to uh, prevent people from doing this by restricting compute. No, it, you know what it is actually what's happening here is one of the concepts I have in the network state is this idea of God, state, and network. Okay. Meaning 
What do you think is the most powerful force in the world? Is it almighty God? Is it the US government? Or is it encryption, right? Or eventually maybe an AGI, all right? If what, what, what's happening here is a lot of people are implicitly, without realizing it, even if they're secular atheists, they're treating GOV as GOD, okay? They treat the US government as God, as the final mover, no, I appreciate your little, I, I take inspiration from you actually in terms of trying to come up with these little quips that, um, you know, that are memorable. So I was just smiling at that because I, I think you do a, a great job of that. And um, I, I try to incorporate, I, I have less success coining terms than you have, but um, certainly try to follow your example on that front. It's like a helpful, if you can compress it down, it's like more memorable. So that's what I try to do, right? So Exactly. A lot of these people who are secular, think of themselves as atheists, have just replaced G-O-D with G-O-V. They worship the U.S. government as God. And there's two versions of this. You know how like God has both the male and female version, right? The female version is the Democrat God within the USA that has infinite money and can take care of everybody and care for everybody. And the Republican God is the U.S. military that can blow up anybody and it's the biggest and strongest and most powerful America, F yeah, okay? And everybody who thinks of the US government as being able to stop something is praying to a dead God, okay? When you say this, you actually get an interesting reaction from AI safety people where you've actually hit their true solar plexus, all right? The true solar plexus is not that they believe in AI, it's that they believe in the US government. That's a true solar plexus because they are appealing to, they're praying to this dead God that can't even clean the poop off the streets in San Francisco, right? That is losing wars or fighting them to stalemates, that has lost all these wars around the world, that spent trillions of dollars, that's been through financial crisis, coronavirus, Iraq war, you know, total meltdown politically, okay? That has interest, that is now has interest payments more than the defense budget, that is, you know, that spent $100 billion on the California train without laying a single track. It's like that, you know, that uh, Morgan Freeman thing, for, you know, the, the, the clip from Batman where he's like, um, so this man ha is a billionaire, blah, 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 this and that, and your plan is to threaten him, right? And so you're going to create this super intelligence and have Kamala Harris regulate it? Come on, man, so to speak, right? Like th these people are praying to a blind, deaf, and dumb God that was powerful in 1945, right? That's why, by the way, all the popular movies, what are they? It's Barbie. It's Oppenheimer, right? It's uh, it's Top Gun. They're all throwbacks to the 80s or the 50s when the USA was really big and strong. And the future is a black mirror. Yeah, I think that's tragic. I, I, one of the projects that I do like, and you might appreciate this, I don't know if you've seen it, is the From the Future of Life Institute, a project called Imagine a World, I think is the, the name of it. And they basically challenged you know, their audience and the public to come up with positive visions of a future, you know, where technology changes a lot and obviously AI pretty central to a lot of those stories. And, you know, what are the challenges that people go through and how do we get there and whatever, but uh, a, a purposeful effort to, ima to imagine positive futures, super underprovided. And I, I really liked, um, the the investment that they made in that. You know, some, one of the things I've got in the Never Exceed book is there's certain megatrends that are happening, right? And megatrends, I mean, it's possible for like one miraculous human maybe to reverse them, okay? Because um, I think both the impersonal forces of history theory and the great man theory of history have some truth to them. But the megatrends are the decline of Washington, D.C., the rise of the internet, the rise of India, the rise of China. That is like my worldview. And I can give a thousand graphs and charts and so on for that, but that's basically the last 30 years and maybe the next X, right? I'm not saying there can't be trend reversal. Of course, there can be trend reversal, as I just mentioned, some hammer blow could hit it, but that's what's happening. And so because of that, the people who are optimistic about the future are aligned with either the internet, India, or China. And the people who are not optimistic about the future are blue Americans or left out red Americans, okay? Or Westerners in general who are not tech, tech people, okay? If they're not tech people, they're not up and to the right, basically. Because the internet's, if you, I mean, one of the things is we have a misnomer, as I was saying earlier, of calling it the United States, because it's the disunited States. 
it's uh, it's like talking about, you know, talking about America is like talking about Korea. There's North Korea and South Korea, and they're totally different populations. And, you know, communism and capitalism are totally different systems. And uh, the thing that is good for one is bad for another and vice versa. And so like America doesn't exist. There's only, just like there's no Korea, there's only North Korea and South Korea. There's no America. There's blue America and red America and also gray America, tech America. And blue America is harmed or they think they're harmed or they've gotten themselves into a spot where they're harmed by every technological development, which is why they hate it so much, right? AI versus journalist jobs, crypto takes away banking jobs, you know, everything, you know, self-driving cars, they just take away regulator control, right? Anything that reduces their power, they hate. And they're just trying to freeze in amber with regulations. Red America got crushed a long time ago by offshoring to China and so on. They're they're making you know inroads to ally with Tech America or Gray America. Tech America is like the one piece of America that's actually still functional and globally competitive. And people always do this fallacy of aggregation where they talk about the USA, and it's really this component that's up and to the right, and the others that are down and to the right, or at best flat, like red, but they're like down, right? Like red is like okay functional, blue is down. Point is. Tech America, I think we're going to find is not even truly or how American is tech America? Because it's like 50% immigrants, right? And like a lot of children immigrants and most of their customers are overseas and their users are overseas and their vantage point is global, right? And they're basically not, um, I know we're in this ultra nationalist kick right now. And I know that there's going to be, there's a degree of a fork here where uh, you fork technology into Silicon Valley and the internet, okay? Where Silicon Valley is American and they'll be making like American military equipment and so on and so forth and they're signaling USA, which is fine, okay? And then the internet is international global capitalism. And the difference is Silicon Valley or let's say US tech, let me less, you know, US tech says ban TikTok, build military equipment, et cetera. It's really identifying itself as American. And it's thinking of being anti-China, okay? But there's, US and China are only 20% of the world. 80% of the world is neither American nor Chinese. So the internet is for everybody else who wants actual global rule of law, right? When as the US decays as a rules-based order and people don't wanna be under China, people wanna be under something like blockchains where you've got like property rights, contract law across borders that are enforced by an impartial authority, okay? That's also the kind of laws that can bind AIs like AIs across borders, if you want to make sure they're going to do something, cryptography can bind an AI in such a way that it can't fake it. It can't, an AI can't mint more Bitcoin, you know? My, here's my last question for you. AI discourse right now does seem to be polarizing into camps. Obviously, a big way that you think about the world is by trying to figure out, you know, what are the different camps, how do they relate to each other, so on and so forth. I have the view that AI is so weird and so unlike other things that we've encountered in the past, including just like, unlike humans, right? I always say AI alien intelligence, that I feel like it's really important to, to borrow a phrase from Paul Graham, keep our identities small and try to have a scout mindset to really just take things on their own terms, right? And not necessarily put them through a prism of like, whose team am I on? Or, you know, is this benefit my team or hurt the other team or whatever? Um, but, you know, just try to be as kind of directly engaged with the things themselves as we can without mediating it through all these lenses. You know, I think about you mentioned like the gain of function. Right. And I don't know for sure what happened, but it certainly does seem like there's a very significant chance that it was a lab leak. Certainly there's a long history of lab leaks, but it would be like, you know, the, it would seem to me a failure to say, OK, well, What's the what, well, what's the opposite of just having like a couple of government labs? Like everybody gets their own gain of function lab, right? Like if we could, and this is kind of what we're doing with AI. We're like, let's compress this power down to as small as we can. Let's make a kit that can run in everybody's home. Would we want to send out these like gain of function, you know, wet lab research kits to like every home in the world and be like, hope you find something interesting, you know, like let us know if you find any new uh pathogens or, Hey, maybe you'll find life-saving drugs, like whatever. We'll see what you find, you know, all 8 billion of you. That to me seems like it would be definitely a big misstep. And that's the kind of thing that I see coming out of ideologically motivated reasoning 
or like, you know, tribal reasoning. And so I guess I wonder how you think about the role that tribalism and ideology is playing and should or shouldn't play as we try to understand AI. Okay. So first is, uh, you're absolutely right that just because A is bad does not mean that B is good, right? So A could be a bad option. B could be a bad option. C could be a bad option. There might be, you have to go down to option G before you find a good option, or there might be three good options and seven bad options, for example, right? So to map that here, in my view, an extremely bad option is to ask the US and Chinese governments to do something. Anything the US government does at the federal level, at the state level in blue states, at the city level, has been a failure. And the way, the, here's, a, here's a meta way of thinking about it. You invest in companies, right? So as an investor, here's a really important thing. You might have 10 people who come to you with the same words in their pitch. They're all, for example, building social networks. But one of them is Facebook and the others are Friendster and whatever, okay? And no offense to Friendster, you know, the, the, those guys were like, you know, pioneers in their own way, but they just got outmatched by Facebook. So the point is that the words were the same on each of these packages, but the execution was completely different. So could I imagine a highly competent government that could execute and that actually did, you know, uh, like, you know, make the right balance of things and so on? I can't say it's impossible, but I can say that it wouldn't be this government. Okay. And so you are talking about the words and I'm talking about the substance. The words are, we will protect you from AI, right? In my view, the substance is they aren't protecting you from anything, right? You're basically giving money and power to a completely incompetent and in, in fact, malicious organization, which is Washington DC, which is the US government that has basically over the last 30 years gone from a hyperpower that wins everywhere without fighting to a declining power that fights everywhere without winning, okay? Like just literally burn trillions of dollars doing this take maybe the greatest decline in fortunes in 30 years in maybe human history. Not even the Roman Empire went down this fast on this many power dimensions this quickly, right? So giving that guy, let's trust him. That's just people running an old script in their heads that they inherited. They are not thinking about it from first principles that this state is a failure, okay? And like how much of a failure it is, you have to look at the sovereign debt crisis, you look, have to look at graphs that other people aren't looking at. But like, you know, the, the, the domain of what blue America can regulate is already collapsing because it can't regulate Russia anymore. It can't regulate China anymore. It's less able to regulate India. It's less able even to regulate Florida and Texas. States are breaking away from it domestically. So this gets to your other point. Why is the tribal lens not something that we can put in the back? We have to put in the absolute front because the world is retribalizing. Like basically your tribe determines what law you're bound by. If you think you can pass some policy that binds the whole world, well, there have to be guys with guns who enforce that policy. And if I have guys with guns on their side that say, we're not enforcing that policy, then you have no policy. You've only bound your own people. Does that make sense, right? And so Blue America will probably succeed in choking the life out of AI within Blue America. But Blue America controls less and less of the world. So it'll have more power over fewer people. I can go into why this is, but essentially, you know, a financial Berlin Wall is arising. There's a lot of taxation and regulation and effectively financial repression, de facto confiscation that will have to happen for the level of debt service that the U.S. has been taking on. OK, just there's there's one graph just to make the point. And if you want to dig into this, you can. All right. But the reason this impacts things is when you're talking about AI safety, you're talking about AI regulation. You're talking about the US government, right? And you have to ask, what does that actually mean? And it's like, in my view, it's like asking the Soviet Union in 1989 to regulate the internet, right? That's going to outlive you know, the country. US interest payment on federal debt versus defense spending. The white line is defense spending. Look at the red line. That's just gone absolutely vertical. That's interest. And it's going to go more vertical next year because all of this debt is getting refinanced at much higher interest rates. This is why, the, look at this, you want, you want AI timelines, right? The question for me is DC's timeline. What is DC's time left to live? Okay, this is the kind of thing that kills empires and, and you either have this just go to the absolute moon or they cut rates and they print a lot. And either way, 
you know, the, the fundamental assumption underpinning all the AI safety, all the AI regulation work is that they have a functional golem in Washington, D.C., where if they convince it to do something, it has enough power to control enough of the world. When that assumption is broken, then a lot of assumptions are broken, right? And so in my view, you have to, um, you, you must think about a polytheistic AI world because other tribes are already into this. They're already funding their own, right? The proliferation is already happening and they're not going to bow to blue tribe. So I, I, that's why I think the tribal lens is not secondary. It's not some you know, totally separate thing. It is an absolutely primary way in which to look at this. And in a sense, it's almost like a, you know, in a well done movie, all the plot lines come together at the end. Okay. And all the disruptions that are happening, the China disruption, the rise of India, the rise of the internet, uh, the rise of crypto, the rise of AI and the decline of DC and the internal political conflict and you know various other theaters like what's happening in Europe and you know and, and and Middle East, all of those come together into a crescendo of ah. Oh, there's a lot of those graphs that are all happening at the same time, and it it's not something you can analyze by just I think looking at one of these curves on its own. I think that's a great note to wrap on. I am always lamenting the fact that so many people are thinking about this AI moment in just fundamentally too small of terms. But uh, I don't think you're one that will easily be accused of that. So with uh, an invitation to come back and continue in the not too distant future, for now, I will say, Balaji Srinivasan, thank you for being part of the Cognitive Revolution. Thank you, Nathan. Good to be here. It is both energizing and enlightening to hear why people listen and learn what they value about the show. So please don't hesitate to reach out via email at tcr at turpentine.co or you can DM me on the social media platform of your choice. OmniKey uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in OmniKey so much that I invested in it, and I recommend you use it too. Use Cogrev to get a 10% discount.